Professor Katerina Zakaria, I'm the Chair of the Department, and it is my immense pleasure to welcome so many of you. And we have more papers and presentations today than ever before. Um, I also wanted to uh, begin with some very encouraging news for our department. Um, as you may know, there's been this campaign that we've been um, putting together for the last couple of years, or three years since we were uh, evaluated externally and we're making our pledges for more positions in the department. Um, we started in the fall the learning community events and I hope that many of you are attending and as of next year you can all classics majors and minors please register for zero credit in the fall and one credit in the spring so long as you follow 80% of these presentations and we build our community you'll get a credit at the end of the year. Um, I'm mentioning that because this seems to have been what um, one of our capstone uh, presenters today called a renaissance in the department. And I want to tell you I've been here for a very long time. In fact, in, uh, I came in January 99, so this is my 24th year at LMU. And we used to be four uh, faculty, tenure track faculty, and we're now two, with five very strong part-time um, instructors, adjunct instructors that are actually a part of our family and they make the change that you see here now. So in 2014, uh, when uh, my colleague Caroline Sauvage was uh, hired to join us as the fourth member of the department, we only had seven majors and about four minors. As of today, we have 16 majors and 26 minors. So thank you guys. So an applause for this. We also have a number of news that I hope my uh, colleague, Professor Sauvage, will announce as she announces her students. Um, she can tell you more about the Archaeology Center, but what I wanted to say is her book is in print. And so I wanted to... It's uh, printed. It's printed. It's printed. So um, the, it, I wanted you to say something about this. We hope to have a book launch for the book. So um, I, it is à la découverte du uh, royaume du Caris, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So um, I will ask my colleague Caroline Sauvage to come introduce herself, her work at the center, and the students who went to excavations, and each one of the faculty who have uh, supervise the capstones and presentations will come and introduce their students and maybe say something about their own research so you'll get to meet both the faculty and the students. Thank you very much. Let's have a good symposium. I am Professor Sauvage. Uh, nice to see you all or to meet you all if I have not uh, had this chance before. I had no idea I was supposed to talk or introduce my book <laughs> or whatever so I have nothing prepared. Um, so my book is all in French, so I don't expect you to read it. Uh, however, it's on a very nice subject. It is uh, on an archaeological site that is uh, in today's Syria, uh, that has been, of course, inaccessible for research since uh, 2009. And um, I will be teaching a seminar next fall on this uh, on this site, and I have managed to get a lot of objects from uh, CGU in Clermont, but also from some uh, private collectors uh, in the US to loan us their material from New Garage, which is also known as Ras Shamra, North of Latakia, uh, into the Syria. And uh, we will work on this material and make an exhibit, design an exhibit at the Hanan Library for spring 2024. So if you want to do some hands-on uh, research on some archaeological Material, let me know. You can register for this class next year, and um, you will get a pretty good summary of whatever is in my book uh, by doing that, so you don't need to read it. Um, second thing, the Archaeology Center in Museum uh, is still being remodeled. Uh, I think it's going to be a long term project for the next at least five years, but uh, there is some internships going on in the museum on a regular basis. Uh, next year, uh, they are also online, it's going to be on Wednesdays. There's two different internships, one to work on a collection of objects. So until now, we have been working on the lamps. I'm happy to report that 
we're almost done with the labs. Uh, we can set up the mode. So now we need to finish a few things this semester. And next semester, we will pick another group of objects. Um, and of course, we will pick it at the beginning of the semester so that you're all excited about it. Uh, the second internship is about curation. Uh, so you will be working on, say, a small group of objects or one or two objects in the museum, trying to find a way to better display them and also to write uh, labels, caption, and short text explaining the material. Uh, this semester, students have been working on redesigning the Tomba exhibit in New Hall. We are also almost done, but I think we're going to spill over a little bit uh, to our next semester if the budget is approved, if everything is approved. So you should very soon see a new redesigned Tomba exhibit, which is very exciting because uh, it's been a long time coming. Um, so yeah, so that's about what is going on in, uh, in the museum. Uh, the library is also being catalogued, so starting next year, you should be able to do your research projects in the library with the catalog that is online. So that's also very exciting. Uh, today we will start the symposium with uh, two presentations by students who went on digs, on excavations. Um, the first one is Sean uh, Trenotti and the second one is Sam Bonilla. So Sean went uh, to Israel last summer while Sam went to Cyprus last week. Uh, and then he came back on Sunday. Um, so I will introduce Sam at the end of uh, Sean's talk. But so Sean went uh, to Israel and excavated a site called Hippo Susita. Um, he went for months, right? Right. Um, and he will describe first the site and then his fantastic experience that he had traveling in the Near East. And I hope that it will all motivate you to also go on digs and discover what archaeological fieldwork is about and what it means. You do not need to go to Israel, you can do it in California or wherever you want in the world. You just need to come and talk to me and we will set this up. So uh, thank you and uh, thank you for welcoming Sean. Um, John Trinati. Today I'll be doing my presentation on my, my dig I did this summer to hip Cita, which is in Israel. Uh, first, give a little background on the dig site itself. It's located in northern Israel, uh, the Sea of Galilee. I wish I was a little further to the left, but it's right there. Um, uh, it's, it's the, city, the place I'm staying in is called Ein Gev. That's not actually the site. The site itself is located on a hill that's to the east, or east side of it, and the actual site is located close to the Syrian and Jordanian. Uh, the place where I was staying was called Kibbutz Ein Gev. It was founded in 1937. We stayed there. It's a small fish and farming village. It had a population of 676, and as you can see from the images on the right, very beautiful beaches, much to my surprise. Um, I'll give you a little background on what the site would have looked like prior to it being destroyed. It doesn't look like that nowadays, obviously. Um, this isn't the site itself. This is a, re a recreation of a Roman city called Jirash. It's also part of the Decapolis, which is a series of ten cities in Israel, which Hippos was part of. Uh, it highlights several important features typical of Roman cities of the period, including you know, bathhouses, forums, uh, amphitheater walls, uh, an insula, which are essentially a type of party blocks, and yeah, just the usual Roman stuff. In terms of the history of the site, uh, it has a Hellenistic, Roman, and Byzantine city as several layers of occupation. It was founded in 200 BC by the Seleucid Empire, which were essentially a Hellenistic successor state to Alexander the Great's Empire. Uh, the city itself has granted, granted significant autonomy, including the right to mint its own coins. So you can kind of go through. There's a horse on it. It's pretty cool. Um, it was the, the strategic location made it an excellent fortification. It's on the Sea of Galilee. It has a very good commanding view of the area, controlling north-south trade routes. Uh, eventually, the Romans conquered it but under Pompey Magnus in 63 BC. And during this period, the city was greatly expanded. Uh, the, it had an implementation of a Roman city plan, uh, constructed an aqueduct, a theater, and a daeon, which is a sort of shrine, a basilica, and a cistern. A series of bathhouses and beautiful funerary monuments were also a testament to the wealth and growing power of Hippos during this period. In the background on the left there, you can see Tiberius in the background, which was the main administrative capital during the Roman period, but it's still beautiful. And following the following this, it became part of the Roman Decapolis, which again was a series of ten cities in the Roman. Uh, Palestine province. 
Uh, it was conquered by the Rashi Caliphate in the 7th century CE and was destroyed by an earthquake on January 18th, 749 CE, and was never resettled subsequently. The site itself was rediscovered in 1883 by Gottlieb Schumacher when he visited a site known in Arabic as Kulat el Kusum. Um, and then, following the construction of a military post by the IDF in the 1950s, the site became more well known and archaeological digs started in earnest in the early 2000s. All right, in terms of the actual geography and the surrounding of the site, it is located on a highly defensible hill. It is surrounded by two cliffs, sorry, by cliffs and two river valleys, and has access to fresh water via an aqueduct, which you can't see from there, unfortunately. Um, the farmland isn't great, as you can probably imagine. However, there was excellent olive oil and morning, the morning of the soil there. It did have access to Sea Valley for fish and trade, and it does have a port, which is located up there. You can't see it anymore because it was destroyed, but yeah, we found, we found it somewhere. And it was located on a highly profitable north south trade route because to the west, east of this is all mountains and hills. To the west was obviously the Sea of Galilee. So, in order to go north south, you'd have to do it through this small sort of strip of coastal land. Um, in terms of description of the site, the site itself is located on top of a large hill, and the main Roman road, the Decumanus, travels across the site from east to west. This work, it does, fantastic. Uh, this is the Decumanus, the main road going east to west. Um, what you have here, the entire site is surrounded by a large wall, of which remains the main gate is most excavated and prominent, which you also can't see here, unfortunately. It would be down here. Um, the Roman Forum is located in the geographic center of the city, which is right here. And also houses the Odeon, the main period shrine over here, as well as a winery term bath, baptistry in the Christian period right here. Um, to the south is the town's main bathhouse right here, which is excavated two seasons prior. And also here, this way. These are the, over here are the two main basilicas of the town, which are sort of later marketplaces. And right here are the 1950s IDF barracks we used as our sort of new visitor center, which also this place is being turned into a national park, which is cool. The dig site. Um, during my time at Hippos, we excavated three separate locations in the city, the Cardo, the tomb, and the burnt church, which I will also now introduce you to. Uh, this photo was always fun. The site is located on the original Israeli border, the Israeli-Syrian border, and this height, the site was heavily fortified by the IDF. Fortunately, they've pretty well cleared the area since. The first site I'll show you is the Cardo, or the north-south route of the main, of the city's main Roman road, which had been discovered the previous year, intersecting with the other road in Decumanus. Uh, the Decumanus, as you can see here, this here. What? No, this is the Decumanus. This is the Cardo right here. Um, is an east-west road and directly connects to the main gate of the city, making this an important intersection right here. Uh, the cardo itself can be broken down into two sections, north and south, this being the north section, this being the south. And once the section of the cardo previously discovered and its adjacent buildings were completely excavated, this section here, we decided to excavate this area instead. And we left a gap for context as well as just so you can get a better idea of what actually would have been constructed here. The northern side of the cardo, the first part of the cardo excavated was that contained the most intact paving stones of the road. As you can see on the left, that's very good road. Um, off to the right is a building that was partially excavated last season, which we continue to excavate this season. Uh, it has three layers of occupation. It has a Roman house built on top of an earlier Hellenistic structure, which we didn't actually realize at first, and then a Byzantine house built of spolia or VU stones of the previous two. And you can see here on the right, you can tell it's Roman because it's well built. You can tell it's Greek because it's down here and not, not as well constructed. And you can tell it's Byzantine because it's a mix of both. So, yeah. Uh, the southern part of the Cardo, which we excavated solely this season, uh, this section of the dig site is where we had the most intensive digging take place and where we used heavier machinery such as a backhoe to clear debris and topsoil much more efficiently. Uh, the Cardo continued southwards for about 20 feet before the clearly defined and carved Roman pavers begin to give way to what appeared to be Byzantine later gravel, clearly, clearly showing either spoliation of the street pavers or just the street expansion in a later period. Uh, it was in this section where we had discovered a new intersection with a previously unknown east-west road, as well as three new Roman era buildings. Um, some more photos showing the clearly defined walls on the left there. Showing the new walls of the buildings. This is a Corinthian capital we discovered, as well as you can see the layers of the road and the lights along it. So. Uh, the other part of the site we were excavating was in the Acropolis. Uh, there are dozens of caves and rock cut tombs spread out across the hillsides near the site. However, the area with the highest concentration and wealth of burials is in the Acropolis. 
So far, 13 large stone tombs have been discovered, many engraved and decorated with local floral patterns. Uh, the Rock Cut Tomb. The Rock Cut Tomb we excavated was just outside on the hillside to the north of the Dick Marks. It was just outside the bounds of the city walls in the main sort of necropolis. This specific tomb was discovered the last few days of the previous season, and given how deeply it was buried, the Dick organizers had been anxious to excavate, hoping that it hadn't been looted like the majority of the other ones had been in antiquity. Uh, when they first reached the entrance, they found two things that were interesting. Up on the top here is an epitaph in Greek, which was eventually translated, so I wasn't able to get it on my time. And the further down we went, we found a large stone column that had somehow made its way to the tomb's entrance, which we were all kind of puzzled by. Um, we weren't sure as to how or when this would have taken place, and as such, we were all rather intrigued by it. After the conclusion of the excavation of the tomb, about four days later, it turned out that it had unfortunately been looted sometime in antiquity, and no remains were to be found. It was, however, nice place to cool off, awaiting for the bus, because it was about 15 degrees cooler than the rest of the site. Um, they also, a couple months ago, released these 3D scans of the tomb. You can see very clearly three antechambers. Um, it's really it's pretty simple. And also, the use of technology like this in archaeology is generally revolutionizing when we look at sites. And the fact that we can actually look at this from, I think, 5,000 miles away. I can't remember the exact number, but yeah, it's very impressive. Uh, the third part of the dig, which we I took part of, was involving burnt church. Uh, one of the focuses of the dig this season, it was previously uncovered over the last couple seasons. Um, it had beautiful mosaics and murals remaining. Um, I spent most of my time there cleaning and photogra photographing the murals and mosaics. And we had a little bit of excavation in this room on the right here. You can't see very well here, but you'll see it in the next section. And I can see you guys looking at this and thinking, that doesn't really look very beautiful. However, this is what looked like at the end of the day. Um, obviously, you can see on the left, these are all the mosaics we've cleared out. We've um, spent a very long time cleaning, make sure it's looks good. We've photographed all these. You can see there's Greek, Greek mosaics, Greek inscriptions here, lots of patterns of fish, dates, baskets, very few beautiful patterns. Um, also, at the top here, in the rear of the church, a reliquary was discovered made of red limestone, and in its center was a bowl shaped depression with two rectangular tiles. It was likely used to hold relics of some kind, and in the southern hall, a marble rectangular tile was found, probably served as a covering. There were also two chancel screens discovered separating the main floor from the apse, made of white marble, seemingly showing the scene from gold. You can kind of see it here, of course, the donkey and whatnot. Uh, in the first week, the first week was pretty straightforward. We got a tour of the site. We talked about the schedule, um, clean and prep the site, mostly just cleaning, making sure that it's well and ready to be done. Um, most of my excavation this week was excavation on the carta. Uh, we washed pottery and mosaic tiles pretty much every day after the dig, which is one part of archaeology. And most of the time I spent adjusting to the heat because most of the days I was there it was around 115. So we started fairly very early in the morning and ended around brunch time. So. Uh, the first thing I found this week was plaster, actually. Uh, there were quite a few of the large pieces of plaster I discovered excavated in Cardo. Um, these would have been from walls and buildings somewhere in the construction area, and they were very quickly wrapped up and shipped off to the University of Haifa, and I didn't see them again until I looked on the Facebook for the site later this year. Um, they actually had taken them to the university and started cleaning them off, and as you can see here, they're still very intact. You can see the murals, you can see the paint, it's still been there, so obviously there's a bit of a upgrade from that to that, but, yeah. Uh, week two, we excavated the rock cut tomb. Uh, we dug a cardo, and I discovered M4 pieces, a seashell, a new Hellenistic wall, and something fairly cool. Um, we also began excavating the southern cardo. At this point, we finished the northern one. We had a German television crew come and film us, which was a fun experience. Um, we discovered mosaic tiles, millstones, a mortar, a glass bottle, and also began washing more pottery. Uh, in this section here, uh, while digging and finishing up the room, what had been dismissed as part of a staircase um, had actually turned out to be a previously unknown wall under the earlier Roman and Byzantine ones. It turned out to be, sorry, see right here? This is what it looked like when we were sort of cleaning up and finishing the room. When I was excavating, I found this wall here, which actually turned out to be an earlier Hellenistic building underneath the previous two. However, the next day was very interesting because I was digging in the corner right here. And I looked at the stone and immediately paused because I had found gold. And I originally picked it up and I imagined it was part of a candy wrapper because it was just it was too shiny and I didn't really believe that it was actually gold because that didn't think that would happen. 
And then I did eventually pick up, yes, it wouldn't have been buried under a rock. It was that. So I had my Nick supervisor come over, and he was a radical Polish guy, really great. Um, he came over to examine it. He immediately radioed everybody to come on over. So the dig site stopped for a good while there. Quickly put it into a bag and safely stored it. And as a result, I was promoted to assistant manager by Braddock. But <laughs> it's a good sense of humor. But you know, everybody asks when they're a bigger piece. I'll never tell. Um, yeah. <laughs> the following day, we moved to the southern side of the Nicomanos, and I discovered this millstone and mortar, as well as a new entryway to the building. So. Week three was pretty straightforward. We moved to the burnt church, new mosaics, discovered new mosaics. We discovered a new inscription dedicated to the priests that live there. Uh, a French TV crew came and filmed us, which was also fun. Um, we photographed, photographed and mapped the site, returned to the southern cargo to discover a new mosaic, recover the mosaics, and then there was a fire, but fortunately nothing happened. Um, the first one on the left was the first mosaic I uncovered on the first day, which was a wheel and laid with spikes here with white spokes. Pretty beautiful. The second one was a dedicatory inscription attributed to two local nobles who built on the church. This one in the middle here, this was found in that little sort of right antechamber I pointed out earlier at the church. And then the third, and my favorite one up here, also down here, uh, is a chicken. We found it in the church, and I, I suggested the name Chick-fil-A, which stuck, so yeah. Uh, again, cleaning mosaics, some people love it. It's very slow work. You're going on every single tile with a scalpel, a brush, some sponges and water, and cleaning the tiles. It looks really beautiful when you're done. Not exactly my favorite thing, but it's really cool. I love the process nonetheless. We also had a conservationist on the site restoring and repairing them. She was like a professional in it. She could go about 20 times faster than the rest of us. So, yeah. Um, when we were done with that, and near the end of the dig, we had to clean, we cleaned the photographs, sorry, we cleaned the mosaics using sponges. We got as best as we could because if you let it dry, it looks sort of washed out and dusty. Uh, we took as many photos as we could, and then we had to recover the mosaics because I mean, you might be asking, like, why did you go through all the effort of uncovering it, taking photos, doing all that, and then just have to recover it? However, a couple reasons. One is that allowing it to be exposed to weather can cause more damage than having it been buried in the first place. Like, water can very easily grow up a lot of stuff. Uh, second, people coming and just stealing it. If they know it's there, people will come and steal it. And also, this is now a national park in Israel, it's become a national park, so it is open to the public. So leaving it open is not a good idea. Um, so we just, the way we do it is we put down a layer of very fine sand, most uh, organic particulate, and sort of sift it out. We then put down a large tarp over the entire site and then very much more regular dirt so it's more natural. So, yeah. Perks of archaeology. Perks of art being an archaeologist and going on a dig besides good work out on its hand. Um, obviously, the most important thing food. Um, one of the most important perks is obviously food. If you ever had a bad meal in Israel, um, like this was fish from the Sea of Galilee. This was from a Spanish restaurant in Jerusalem, which was surprisingly good. Uh, Yemeni food, Georgian food, shawarma, falafel, and obviously pizza on the Sea of Galilee, because why not? Um, we also got to do a lot of traveling, which is one of my favorite parts of going on takes. You get to actually experience local culture and go places in the site. Um, on the top left here, this is in Tiberias, which is obviously the city across from the Galilee. Um, this is an archaeological site in the Golan Heights. We actually got to visit the Golan Heights, and there's a winery there. They have really good Moscato, if anybody's interested. Um, I also got to go to Jerusalem for one of the weekends, which, again, probably one of the best experiences of my life. It's an incredibly beautiful city with a rich history. Some of the friendliest people, again, I can't stop talking about the food, because I'm hungry for food. And on my last day there, I got to go to Caesarea, which is this. One minute. Oh, I'm not going um, it's a beautiful city on the North Sea of Israel. I visited the last day of the country. It's an incredible site. Just go. Um, and then finally, the most important thing is good friends. You know, meet very good people who actually can like help you out with a lot of stuff and share amazing experiences. And also, <laughs> final side note, we had nine different languages being spoken on the big site. So. Hello, everyone. I'm Sam. I'm um, like Dr. Savage. I uh, just said I went to Cyprus for two weeks. Um, and I got a chance to look at some archaeology, look at the country, and uh, it was an amazing experience. So really, really good. Yeah. All right. So to start off, just a bit of a, you know, a little bit of 
history of Cyprus. Um, it's located in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea, which is really, really beautiful. Uh, south of Turkey, west of Lebanon and Syria, north of Egypt, and of course, southeast of Greece. A lot of people like to think of it as Greece 2.0 because a lot of the culture and um, the people are very similar. And uh, its location made the island a crucial link in trade relationships, especially when it comes to copper. It actually gets its name from, uh, copper actually gets its name from Cyprus. Um, and it was really, really rich in the ancient world. And, uh, and here's a bit of a timeline of some of the periods that I got to look at. Uh, my main period, the one, I was, the one that we focused on for the buildings that we looked at, was the Calcolithic period, which is right in the middle, around 3000 BC. And um, yeah, these are some aerial shots that I got to see on the plane and once I got there. So. Um, okay, so the first week, I think we got to see most of uh, the landmarks that were really, really beautiful. Um, so these are some of them. So Tombs of the King is located near Pathos, which is the city that I was uh, staying at. Um, and it dates back to incredible 4th century BC, and there's a bunch of tombs of aristocrats, uh, and they've all been excavated. Um, they call it Tombs of the Kings because they kind of want tourists to kind of go and, and see them, but they're not really kings, they're just really wealthy individuals. Um, and yeah, and uh, there's traditional concepts of, of the housing and that resemble like the tombs of the dead. There's columns that have been found that we can kind of see how people lived back then. Um, another one was the Petra Tau Rome, Romeo, um, which is basically Aphrodite's sanctuary. Um, and it's basically a temple, but they don't really like classifying it as a temple because Aphrodite's temple is actually in Greece. Um, but it, it was, it sits like on this little cliff and there's a huge, huge rock uh, right beneath it. And according to mythology, that's where Aphrodite was born. That's where she came, like rose from the water. Um, and yeah, and then another one is Mount Olympus. So it actually happens to be a huge mountain. Uh, they call it Mount Olympus because they want to, you know, associate themselves with a lot of like, Greek mythology, but it's not really the traditional location of Mount Olympus. Um, it's just a really, really tall mountain, but they call it Mount Olympus to attract tourists. Okay, uh, so this, so here we're getting a little more to like the actual archaeology and like the, like the digs that have, that other people have, have, uh, have done there. Um, so the first one is Neophytus Monastery. So this individual is uh, an Orthodox saint who passed away, he actually wanted to live in complete isolation. So he went up to the mountains of Cyprus and kind of made his own little room, dug his own grave. And, uh, and yeah, he contributed a lot, like a lot of like the art and a lot of the uh, Catholic religion. Um, a lot of his writings and he eventually became a saint, but uh, some monk eventually made his way up to the mountains and found his tomb. And ever since then, was unearthed, and it's pretty ironic because according to some locals, if you make that hike, you can see his skull in this box, and I mean, you can kiss it for good luck. So you have this monk who wanted to live in complete isolation, and now you can just go kiss the box where his skull is. Um, and then we got to see the Pathos Castle, which was erected in the mid-13th century. Uh, it was built to replace another castle, and, um, and yeah, there's like prisons within that. It's pretty popular. And then we have the House of Dionysus, which is... It's not a temple, but it's uh, it's kind of looked at as one. Um, and it's basically a luxury building of the Roman period, which belonged to a Hellenistic type of house. And there's huge, huge floor um, mosaics of just mythology and, and hunts. And I mean, it's pretty unbelievable the kind of imagery that they have. Uh, so that was really, really nice to see. And unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately there's a video here um, that I wanted to show you guys, but I guess it won't work. Maybe it does. Um, so this is, so like Sean mentioned, so this is like modern technology that a lot of archaeologists are currently using. So you can actually get this app if you have the newest iPhone, and you can just walk around any structure and just scan it, and it creates like a perfect, almost perfect 3D scan, which this would 
obviously take a long, long time to do um, with like planning and with photography and all that. Just basic, uh, basic um, strategies and, and like traditional archaeology just take forever. So, um, so yeah, I wanted to share that. It's uh, so this is actually one of the caves um, up in the hills in Cyprus, up in the mountains, and you can see a lot of mosaics, a lot of like the Orthodox uh, Catholicism influence uh, back to Neophytes and like kind of what he did. And throughout, like, so to get into this cave, uh, you have to like ask for a certain key, a certain permission. Um, and the reason why is because throughout the years, throughout the, the you know the centuries, it has been vandalized by like local shepherds. It happened to be Muslim as well. Um, so a lot of like the imagery, there's like you know the faces have been removed because of depictions of, of holy deities and stuff. Um, so yeah, so I was really really interested to see. It's like super hidden, and like if, if you know about it, you know about it. So. It's, I highly recommend that you guys travel and meet some archaeologists because they know all the good spots. <laughs> uh, just some brief uh, history about archaeology within Cyprus. Um, I think the main point here is uh, Porphyrius de Caius. I'm pretty sure I'm butchering his name, but he was the main curator of the Museum of Cyprus. He was the first Cypriot director of the Department of Antiquities. So he really started to put like an actual science and an actual um, strategy to like a lot of the things that they were finding because there's a lot of, uh, of course there's a lot of artifacts that have made their way into the black market. Uh, a lot of people just, you know, find something that looks really nice or, you know, you have grave robbers and they just go and steal whatever and sell it. Um, so he was, he was a huge influence into modern archaeology in Cyprus. And, um, and yeah, because of him, uh, he made a big push and British Museum has been involved in Cyprus, and a lot of teams are currently ex excavating there. Um, current, for me, I was I had the pleasure to be part of the UK, and uh, we had yeah the Scottish team as well. So we were combined, but we got to meet some we got to meet some teams from Australia that are currently uh, digging up in the amphitheater, um, and and yeah, it was amazing. So you have like Italian, you have like the Italians come in, the French come in, and they all have different sites, and they all kind of like help each other and combine as well with, with what they can provide to Cyprus. So, so going into the actual uh, archaeology of it all, so I was focused on the Chalcolithic period. Um, so this was around like 3000, the middle Chalcolithic period, which was 3000 BC, but early and, and later is what I have here. Um, and yeah, so this is the Lady Lemba. So these are it's a huge artifact that they found. It has become like a staple of Lemba, which uh, is where I was staying, and it's even on the currency. Um, and just like you know, learning about the history and the culture of the people that lived there during that time, and uh, using specific strategies to kind of see like how do we actually learn, what do we learn from what we find, and how do we apply it to the future and the past from that period. Um, so it's it's pretty interesting. But I'm gonna move on to. To this, yeah, so Middle Chalcolithic. So I got the pleasure to actually go and see some of the villages, some like the buildings themselves, and kind of see how they were dug up and like the areas that haven't been excavated just yet. Um, and kind of see like when you find something, like how do you go about that? It's not just, you know, obviously, like, I, me personally, like, I would hear about like archaeology, I'd be like, oh, cool, you know, kind of found something, but it's like it goes deeper than that. It's like you have to report everything to like the team. Um, and yeah, so, so yeah, moving on. So yeah, moving on to this. So so it was so the site was Lumbo Lacus, um, and there's different aspects of kind of what I was exploring. So we got to study the economy and kind of learn from like uh, just different remains that you find and what you can learn about in regards to the economy. So um, you know something as simple as some some deer or some bones and some remains that you can find will tell you a lot. Um, so they learned that in the Middle Catholic, they were constantly hunting deer, they were uh, producing barley and wheat, and agriculture was really becoming important to them, it was really taking off. And the interesting thing is, how do we know that? How do we know that, you know, all this is going on during that time? And they use, uh, so archaeologists use specific strategies, so they use fauna remains and flotation. Um, and I got to learn, we got to actually interview and, and speak with uh, professionals that actually focus on, on these things. Um, and basically, 
fauna remains is when you find some remains of some you know animals, obviously. But um, what do you learn from that? You know, whatever you find, how do you really apply that? So. Yeah, so when you find uh, a bone or pretty, of, you know, a remain, you can kind of see if they were hunters or gatherers. And you can kind of see what the purpose of, you know, the animals that they're uh, farming, or that they're using, what the purpose is. Are they using them for the meat? Are they using them for the hides? So are they a, a primary product or a secondary product? Um, secondary meaning like you don't have to kill the animal, you can just use it for the milk and stuff like that. So you're raising more females or more raising more males for the meat. Um, and it was really, really interesting because uh, this specific field, which is called zoo archaeology, um, it was really new to me. And I was really, really impressed with like, you know, how a simple bone can tell you so much. Um, and yeah, and then uh, flotation is a technique where you collect a bunch of soil and you basically float it in water. It can take a really, really long time, but you can find like remains of certain seeds still uh, in there and you can just really determine what they're eating. And from that, you can kind of see like what their diet is and where you're finding these things if the people were tidy or were pretty messy when it comes to like their diet. Um, lastly, the pottery and artifacts, so ceramics, lithics, and ground stones. Um, there's also certain techniques for that, certain things that you're looking for, certain axe heads, uh, like a specific stone, you can kind of see if it's, if it's been uh, you know, shaped a certain way, if it's been smoothed out, and what that stone is being used for, um, which was super interesting. But, yeah, and then going back, or going forward to the actual place that I was at, these are the roundhouses. So in the back, you can see that they recreated them. These are the actual ruins, the actual remains. And the reason why they recreated and made some new ones in the back, kind of using the same process that they would have used, is to see how they would actually um, erode over time. So how they would collapse, and in what way would they actually stand up today? and if there's anything else that we're missing from what is there and from what we have not unearthed. So, so yeah. And then those that have gone on digs know about uh, planning. Um, it happens to be one of the more fun but pretty tedious things about archaeology. So you kind of take this really, really small part of whatever thing you just found and you have to draw it, but you have to draw it to scale. Um, and it can take a very, very long time. And to give you an example of that, that's an actual pen drawing, um, and that can take a very, very long time. So uh, on the right is the side of a wall, or is the aerial view of a wall, and um, and yeah, and basically you take you take that and you draw it to scale. Um, so yeah, it was pretty tedious, but if you like it, you like it. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, and just to finish off, because I'm running a bit out of time, but. I want to show you guys what the actual roundhouse would have looked like. I guess the mouse died. But anyways, um, so yeah, so that was that was uh, this is what a roundhouse would have looked like, and they're pretty big structures, and and yeah. If you not, have not gone on a dig, I highly recommend it. I know Sean was talking about this, but it is amazing. Um, me personally, I was only there for a short amount of time, but in that time, I learned so much. And just learning about the country itself and seeing all the different parts and all the different history that it has. And speaking with the locals, um, funny story, I was actually invited every night to watch soccer, they call football, um, with the locals. It was, uh, it was pretty neat. I got to meet like, the, the mayor there, and we were just... Uh, I don't know, we became friends. I was kind of looking for the Wi-Fi password and he ended up giving it to me, so it was, uh, it was a great experience. And, and yeah, I, I really, really love Lumpa. Thank you so much for, for your time. Here we go. Okay, so this is Miles Paul, and he is actually a veteran because he gave a presentation at the Classics and Archaeology Symposium last year. Uh, you are a senior this year, though, so you're graduating with a film production no. major minors in classics and archaeology, art history, and screenwriting. Uh, and he was in the archaeology lab class and we studied the early Bronze Age Levant. And so we gave a great paper for that that we're going to have him talk about today. Thank you, Miles. All right, hello everyone again. I'm Miles Bollock. Um, 
And like Professor Fessler said, I'm actually a film production major, and I've really enjoyed my time in the class as an archaeology minor. Um, but this class was the first class that I took um, that focused on archaeology rather than classics. So um, I was really new to all this archaeology stuff, um, and I kind of approached this topic from uh, the, the viewpoint of uh, the newcomer. So um, for my paper for the class, it's called Differences in Death, Diversity and Burial in the Early Bronze Age of a Bond. Um, I've always been fascinated by burial practices. Uh, my family's from New Orleans. There's a lot of really cool graves there. So I wanted to look into burial practices in this time period for this class. Um, so um, the first day when I got to class, I signed up for the class because it said Archaeology Lab. I was really excited. But I realized I had no idea what the Levant was when I got to <laughs> class. Um, so I'm going to provide some background for that now. Um, so the Levant is a disparate region in the eastern Mediterranean or the Near East. Uh, that's loosely comprised of modern-day Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Cyprus, parts of Egypt, Turkey, and Iraq. Um, and so these three images I have here, they all show like slightly different areas. This one even, um, Wikipedia one includes parts of Libya, which I don't know if I would agree with that. Um, but so there's kind of a loose definition of what the area is. Um, and today it's home to a very diverse um, population of people and ideas. Um, so when I was approaching this essay, I was thinking about what brings this area together under one term, Levant. Um, so I was looking, maybe the burial practices from this time period are some similarity that, that the region shares. Um, so then just a little bit more background. Um, the Levant kind of exists as a counterpoint to Mesopotamia and Egypt. Those are two um, big civilizations at the same time as the Levant. Um, however, it was able to have its own material culture and stay unique from both Mesopotamia and Egypt, despite being right between them. Um, and then also many people are interested in the region nowadays because it's the home of many world religions. It's the birthplace of Judaism and Christianity and a key spot in the early development of Islam. Um, and over 50% of the world population belongs to one of these religions. So a lot of people are interested in this region. Um, Despite that, it's, it has this kind of mysterious prehistory, as everywhere it does, because it's poor writing. Um, so oftentimes, burials are the only record that is left of a civilization, which is why studying burials from a time period like this is very elucidating of what their society was like. Um, so just a little background on the early Bronze Age I. Um, in the Levant, um, that was 3300 BCE to 3000 BCE. Um, and there was a marked move towards urbanism, although not in the way that we would think today. Um, just people started living together in permanent civilizations. Um, in Egypt, this was the pre-dynastic period. Um, in Mesopotamia, this was during the Uruk expansion. Um, so both of those civilizations were expanding, um, touching up against the Levant, but not quite at the peak of their power. Um, but like I said, despite that, the Levant had a unique material culture of their own um, pots and jars and stuff. Um, so, and obviously, as comes from the name of early Bronze Age, this coincides with the use of bronze. Um, and still in the air region, though, there was mainly agro-pastoralist subsistence economy. So that's kind of some background. And now to my paper. Um, my thesis is that a survey of the disparate burial practices of the early Bronze Age Levant suggests the area was not yet culturally unified and displayed differing attitudes towards death and the afterlife. Um, so looking at these different multicultural burial practices um, provides a more nuanced view of the region and shows how ancient outlooks on the afterlife vary regionally because I was very surprised to find that there was a wide range of burial practices during this time of the early Bronze Age. Um, but some important context first. I found this really interesting article in my research uh, on the Invisible Dead Project which um, started out studying um, UK, but then was uh, applied to Levant. And they noticed that there were a lot of deaths missing from the archaeological records that were noticed. Um, so from the remains that existed of societies, uh, archaeologists can tell that, oh, we needed at least this many people for this society to exist. But in the deaths that they found in the area, they, they've noticed a lot of them were missing. So they, ha they thought that perhaps a formal burial um, with a, a headstone and um, or underground burial was perhaps an exception rather than a rule during this early time period. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of um, dead people from this time period that are missing because of that. Um, 
there's also this interesting thing that I learned about archaeology is that it, it seems to me that archaeologists have a bias towards the exceptional rather than the everyday. Um, so we all know about King Tut because that's a very exceptional burial, um, whereas the burials of the slaves that built Egypt, maybe we don't know as much about. Um, so that's also another reason why there's these many invisible dead in these societies. Um, so kind of the question that this article raised is, um, is the invisibility um, related to corpse disposal methods in ancient times, so the way that they dispose of the bodies, or is it related to biases in the archaeological record in modern times? So that's a question I, I looked at in my essay. Um, so when you start looking at the Levant during this time period, there's a clear difference that comes between the northern Levant, um, up there in the north, and the southern Levant, um, in that almost all bur burials found in the archaeological record from the early Bronze Age one um, are found in the southern Levant. So this means that's more than just a field working bias. Um, in the north, there's just a handful of burials that they found at three different sites, um, while as in the south, there are hundreds of tombs at multiple sites. Um, so one of the sites in the northern Levant was Byblos, that had some jar burials, which that's a picture of. Um, however, Byblos was an outpost for Egypt during this time, and Egypt uh, influenced the southern Levant. So some people wouldn't even count this as really a northern Levant site. Um, and then in the southern Levant, Baba Dra is the main site that we talked about in the class because we have a lot of artifacts from there in the, the uh, museum here on campus. Um, and there, there were hundreds of shaft tombs. Um, people were buried along with household goods. Um, but the interesting thing about the site is that nobody lived here. It was a place for nomad nomadic people to come and bury their dead um, as secondary burials. Uh, Jericho is another important site. Um, which had a lot of burials as well, also in Southern Levant. Um, so why is there this disparity between the North and South? Um, there is a bias towards studying the Southern Levant, um, because you've seen the picture, it's Israel is a, is a large part of the Southern Levant. So there's more funding for digs there, and relative to the rest of the area, that's more politically stable, um, so people are able to work there. Um, but more interesting, um, because there is this big disparity, there were different ideas about death in the North and the South. Um, so in the South, burial could prove a person's power in life. You know, they were buried with goods, um, intentionally in ways that would preserve over time. In the North, at this time, it was possible that burial was not necessary or a relevant practice to people there. Um, and this is evinced by the burials that we have found are mainly infant burials, um, which it's much easier to dispose of a smaller person in a permanent way. Um, so that shows that they didn't um, perhaps think about the afterlife as that were in the North during this time period. Um, so then the EB2 and 3, the North and South start to align more. There's higher burial rates in the North. Um, and there are burial practices that reflect the individual more. So maybe this is the way that they mark social stratification. Um, there's diverse burial goods from around the world, like Kirbet Karakware. Um, so that maybe takes on a political and economic aspect to death. Um, in the South, the lower burial rates, but again, it was very high in the time period before. Um, you start seeing charnel houses, which are basically libraries of the dead, where they stack skeletons, kind of like a library that you could enter a room. Um, but there's a distinct lack of conspicuous wealth, but they think um, perhaps that's because they, instead of being buried with gold or something else to show their wealth, they are buried with staples of local economy, um, like wheat if they grew wheat. Um, and then another interesting point about burial in this time period is secondary burials, um, which I had no idea about before I took this class. But basically, there's a widespread practice to bury somebody once, they decompose, and then you move their bones somewhere else. Um, however, I read this really interesting article that talked about reasons why they might do this other than to um, get the bones away from the society. Um, that's because uh, these, these images here show all the, the blue dots are where burials have been found, and all the black triangles are where um, societies or, or places where people lived have been found. So as you can see, there are many, many burial sites where nobody lived nearby. Um, and researchers looked at this to kind of like wonder why they were doing this. And um, they found that a lot of these burial sites were geographically important locations, because in the southern Levant, it's a very hilly terrain. Um, so like moving to faraway places lets you see more of the terrain surrounding you. Um, and they also, it was a way to mark land um, with tumuli, which are basically big hills of, of graveyard. 
difference. Um, so this um, kind of gives a geopolitical meaning to the living of burial. Burial is a way that they can mark out their territory. Because if I see that uh, a rival tribe has planned their graveyard here, I'm probably not going to build my city on top of it or nearby. Um, so this is an interesting way, another aspect that death takes on during this time period. Um, there's even more burials that I haven't talked about. My favorite is the Nuwamis in Sinai. Um, this is just to say there's a lot of diverse practices that happened in the time period um, here. Um, I briefly looked at religion to see if maybe that was something that unified the area, um, but uh, religion was also very diverse during this time period. Um, so in conclusion, looking at the Invisible Dead Project shows the importance of studying the larger picture when it comes to studying something even as simple as death. Um, there's no unifying principle in the region during this time, um, and it shows the changing views on death and burial. Um, at some point, it wasn't thought of as important, um, and the difference between the North and the South. Um, so finally, the Levant has always been a crossroads. It's diverse to this day, and even in this time period, when you look at one thing like burial practices, it was still diverse. So, thank you. Um, so Reggie R is also a senior, and you are also you're also a film and TV major. We like the crossover with all, again these multiple minors. So classics and archaeology minor and a business minor as well. And if you can tell in the early Bronze Age class lab, we talked a lot about burials, and so Reggie is going to give another talk about the interesting aspects of burials during this time. So yeah, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, the early <coughs> burials, and you know how there is kind of this sense of elitism and social class tied to these burials, and the existence of this cult of the dead within them. Um, and some framework questions I had for this paper were, um, why do Levitine burial practices during the early Bronze Age provide insight into the treatment of the dead? Um, and if there's a concept of elitism within this, um, also what connections can be drawn from the trans-regional similarities that exist in these great goods across both Florida and Mesopotamia? Um, also, this presence of the cult of the dead and what does it say about ancient civilizations and you know, what big pictures can be drawn? Um, so for my thesis statement, I said, when surveying Levantine burial sites of the early Bronze Age, the differing makeup of grave goods and various methods of tomb construction suggest the presence of a cult of the dead where a link with posthumous elitism is evident. Such ideology ultimately demonstrates the importance of social class in the ancient world where status not only impacted life but death as well. Um, and so this gives more context of, you know, the cult of the dead and what it really is. Um, it refers to an individual or group that holds a desire of securing an afterlife for themselves or for their relatives. Um, and this is similar to practices of ancestor venerations, and it usually involves offerings for the dead, sacrifices for the dead, those types of things. Um, and during this era, during the early Bronze Age in the Levant, um, there was a rise of the Canaanite religion. It was being practiced more, um, which involved the worshiping of a multitude of deities. Um, um, and something I thought about this was as you know, religious activity rises, you know, more people become spiritually aware, they become more like aware of the afterlife and what life means after death as they're more in tune with um, their religion. Um, and in the cult of the dead, there was evidence I found that there was an exclusion of women in it and it was more catered towards patrilineal descent. Um, this is also parallels with the Marzea, which is kind of like a secret. For elite males, a society for like elite males to like drink basically and converse, um, and women weren't allowed to be a part of that either. Um, also in Jericho, there were lack of woman burials, which I just thought was interesting and it might possibly tie to uh, these themes. Um, and so this posthumous manipulation of bodies that are seen at a multitude of different sites, um, at Baba, Baba Draw, for example, there is evidence of skulls being separated from the rest of the body and being placed next to the skeleton or um, surrounding it. Um, and this also connects with the Tupian um, practices of the Epopaleolithic where they had detached skulls and they would plaster them and decorate them. And this also happened in Jericho. They would have skulls and they would cover them in plaster and kind of have them as 
these objects. Um, and additionally, in Jericho, um, one of the articles I found, um, they, met, they found that there is a different placement of the way the skeletons were found in the grave. Some were crouched and some were in extended positions. And with daggers and other weapons, they weren't present alongside the crouched skeletons, but alongside the extended ones. And it perhaps shows that, you know, the people that were extended were deemed as more important than the ones that were placed in a crouched position um, on these graves. <coughs> and specifically with the grave goods, um, there's a lot of differences seen across different sites and different um, graves in the region. Um, and at Baba Draw specifically, um, there were basalt bowls that were found, which I think you have or something on it. Well, I'm pretty sure you have. Um, there were basalt bowls that were found in some of the graves, which basalt isn't a material that's native to that region, so it shows that this had to be traded or it's an important object that wouldn't just be placed in anyone's graves. Um, and these charnel houses that mine was touched on, um, they found daggers and crescent-shaped axes in some of these charnel houses. And again, what we want was metal poor, so these objects, you know, <coughs> they're placed, um, intentionally placed because they're not just uh, very common. Um, and at Bashul, um, I'm pronouncing that wrong probably, but 17 tombs were found to belong to a local administrative class, and in these tombs, the riches had more than 24,000 pieces of ornaments, including gold and lapis lazuli, which again, these are materials that aren't common, they're rare, and they usually needed to be, to get them in the region, they had to be traded with other areas, so they symbolize kind of prestige. Um, and also I found at Jabal Park here, they found animal carcasses and some singular burials, which um, finding, you know, finding that in a burial, animals can be used for labor, for food, a lot of things, especially in the context of, you know, the ancient world. So if these animals are being sacrificed and placed in people's tombs, it was definitely intentional and not just done for everybody. Um, and just some more cross-regional connections tying in it with uh, Mesopotamia. Um, at the World Cemetery of Ur, which is, you know, a site that we're probably all familiar with. Um, there's evidence of sacrificial rituals there, and there's stone of underground chambers, and, you know, a lot of variations of grave goods in general at the site. Um, and the cemetery has a, it suggests that the cemetery has a connection with the city's temple. And some of these objects were found at the cemetery, which, you know, this necklace has gold and lapis lazuli. This necklace was used with gold, lapis lazuli, and carnelian, and it's similar with this headdress. Um, so again, these precious materials were intentionally being placed in certain tombs, and it kind of shows evidence of, you know, the social class of the person that's found with these objects buried with them. Um, because again, you know, these weren't just being placed in anybody's tombs. And so um, my concluding remarks, basically, you know, these differences in posthumous body manipulation and various types of prestigious goods in select tombs, it alludes to, you know, social class kind of acting as a determinant of the treatment of the afterlife. Um, and there's a, there was a conscious effort that was placed on the dead. It wasn't just a passive, passive thought. Um, and most likely in relation to the cult of the dead, where, you know, the securance of a prosperous afterlife was really important to these ancient peoples. Um, and overall, it kind of just demonstrates how social class not only dominated people when they were alive, but these restrictive boundaries that are tied to wealth, they also impacted, you know, your life once you die, which I just thought that was interesting. Um, and, yeah. So, Alvin Rosa is a minor in classics and archaeology, but she is a senior, and you are a, your, your major is theater arts. Okay, and also she helped us because in our, um, in our uh, ancient warfare class, we did an, a combat class or a theater combat class, and she was the TA for the class, so she taught us all of these moves with the fighting stick. So um, she, we were a big fan of her in that class. Um, but thank you. She's going to talk about a really fun board game that you can still buy today, actually. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Salva, and I wrote my archaeology last paper on the Senate and the early Bronze Age Vermont. 
feel bad. I didn't include the original title I put, which is called Game of Stones. <laughs> I thought it was fun. Um, so let's start with the basics. So what is Senate? Um, it's oftentimes called the world's first board game and traditionally given an Egyptian origin. Um, this potentially might have also been used for religious rituals in Egypt, but by the time it had made its way to the Levant, it was purely used as a form of entertainment. Um, the first remains of a Senate board were found in an Egyptian tomb at the site of Abu Rawash, but the first complete boards were found in the Levant. And this game was also played um, in private and public spheres and across age and class lines. And I spent a good chunk of my paper talking about the game mechanics and its appearance. So Senate comes from an Egyptian word, which means to pass. And it's similar to a lot of modern board games like Monopoly, and it falls under the category of race game or move game, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, all you have to do is get all your markers. In Senate's case, they're called draftsmen from one end of the board to the other end of the board. And whereas today we would use dice, back then they would use, um, in the early Bronze Age, uh, throwing sticks or animal bones. And obviously because of the transitory nature of these markers, uh, the excavated remains are typically in the form of the game boards, um, which were made of stone. Um, so the board's appearance, the boards did vary in size, but the most frequent variation was the 3 by 10 and this is also uh, the size that has carried over into the modern Senate boards. So the 3 by 10 boards provided three playable tiles uh, for you to get your little markers um, across. These boards were also either drilled or had incisions. Um, but the boards that we did find in the Levant uh, were only of the drilled kind. So this photo above is an example of a drilled game board. So that is from uh, a site called Arad in the Levant. And below we have an example, like a sketch of what an incised board might have been. So these were the Senate boards found in Egypt. And also the Egyptian boards were the only ones that had illustrations or hieroglyphics at the end. Again, this might have had a religious purpose at the beginning, but by the time it was used as a game, all these hier hieroglyphics uh, provided sort of special tiles. So when you land on one, it could be a good tile, which meant you could skip a few paces ahead, or a bad tile that might send you back um, at another earlier point in the board. Um, so I looked at three sites uh, in the Levant, uh, which have yielded um, remains of Senate. Uh, the first is a rod. Now, a rod, um, uh, it, it is home to like the largest early Bronze Age group of game artifacts in the Near East, uh, primarily dating to EB1 and EB2. And at the tail end of the early Bronze Age 1, a rod had developed into a commercial hub due to its proximity to the Sinai mines. And unfortunately, there were no game markers excavated at the site. But one of the highlights uh, of the excavations with regards to Senate is this possible tournament board. Um, Senate was also found in private and public areas in Arad, so at homes, but also like in what would have been considered the town center. So uh, this board would have had three sets of three by 10 boards. Um, so the theory is that they might have been used as a tournament board uh, out in the town center. Another site I looked at was Tel Asafi. Um, the Senate remains that were found at the site uh, came a little later, so primarily from EB3. And this area was a site of major political and economic significance in the early Bronze Age. And the excavations at Tel Asafi were kind of unique because they did actually yield gaming, pace, gaming pieces. Sorry. Um, so see a little photo there of the animal bones that might have been used as markers referred to as Ashagali. And another thing, or another interesting thing that Telesophy has yielded were these two double-sided boards that were for two different games. So some of the theories are that one side of the board, uh, one side of the stone might have been a junior version of Senate and then the other side might have been like a senior, more advanced version. Or another theory is that one side would have had the Senate game on it, the other side might have been um, a Levantine game called the 13 Houses game. Um, and the last site I looked at um, was Cyprus. Uh, Senate's presence on this island was a little bit of an anomaly because unlike uh, 
sites in the Levant, like Tel Asafi in Iran, did have strong Egyptian ties or heavy interaction with Egypt around this time. With that being said, there were still 400 game artifacts dating back to that period uh, that were found on Cyprus. And there were um, a lot more game markers that were found on Cyprus because they used limestone as a material. So it obviously had a better chance of surviving rather than using throwing sticks or animal bones. Uh, one of the biggest struggles that have um, come up when determining which are animal bones and just random bones that have been found in, that have been found and which ones were used as game markers, but the limestone markers on Cyprus make it pretty clear. Um, the Cypriot boards were also special in that they were both unlike and like the Levantine boards, and at the same time also unlike and like the Egyptian boards. They were incised, which made them more similar to the Egyptian Zenit boards, but they were also, some were also double-sided and predated the Telesafi double-sided boards, so a little bit similar to the Levantine Zenit boards. So the conclusions I um, had with my paper and kind of my thesis statement was that although Senate had neither administrative or religious significance by the time it reached the Levant, its presence in the re region indicates that the early Bronze Age Egyptians managed to ingratiate themselves into the local population and that their influence on Levantine culture um, remained long after their physical presence in the region had gone. Um, this is uh, evidenced by the fact that Senate was primarily found in sites of uh, uh, sorry, economic significance and less so of the military sites. Um, the various Senate adaptations found at these sites, like Telesophy, Arad, and Cyprus, may also promote the premise that Egypt's initial relationship with the Levant was one of cultural reciprocity, like the double-sided boards may have um, may uh, hint at, whereas one side would be Egypt, one side would be Levant. Uh, rather than martial hostility. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll ask for, for the people that have dug, obviously, like on site, I think Sean, you're one of the only ones up here, I guess, but how much kind of autonomy do they give you right off the bat to just go at like a mountain of dirt or whatever? Or, like, how much do they have kind of hold your hand and gave you for a while? It's uh, a good question. Yeah. It depends on your qualifications as well, because if you go on a dig for they usually more confident in you than if you've never gone on a dig before. And it also depends on what you're working with. like. For my previous dig that I did before with Portugal and also for this one, I the first week is usually heavy with pickaxes, just trying to clear the surface, get everything sort of set for later. So by the time you actually get to a week when you actually do more hands on excavation, you get a smaller pick for travel or shovel or something, you have an idea of what not to break essentially. And there's always a supervisor somewhere nearby. So if you ever, they always say, if you ever, uh, if you ever feel like you want to ask something, just ask. It's better to be, ask it. it's better to ask a stupid question than break something. Also, if you have never dug before, uh, you're more likely to be uh, placed in an area where you cannot really do any damage. Like, it's difficult to destroy the Roman road that we saw versus um, fragile architecture. Uh, so yeah, they would, they would have to do that. And usually, as the weeks go on in the dig and you learn more, then you get more and more responsibility to you get to try your hand on something. You're like, oh, I kind of want to try that. And so your supervisor will come. They're very happy to let you clean mosaic huts. <laughs> yeah, Just a question for all the three students who are not majors but minors. Uh, how did you find working on these projects? How did that um, help you evolve in uh, whatever you want to do with your lives? What, do you, what is your takeaway? So you each did very interesting topics. Can you just say a couple of sentences? On I'll say <laughs> yeah, I'll say this, um, this archaeology class is one of the more difficult classes I've taken, but I think it was, it was a very rewarding process to learn about something that I had no idea. Like I said, I didn't even know what the Levant was before it came in. So it's definitely a, an experience in like critical thinking um, and opening you up to learning new things. Um, I know I definitely want to visit the area. Sean's pictures are very enticing. <laughs> major, um, I'm also a screenwriting minor, so all this stuff can be very helpful in writing stories and coming up and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, it was, like I said, one of the most more challenging classes I've taken while at LMU, primarily because we were writing about a time where writing was not, <laughs> um, but uh, I 
realized uh, that I actually did enjoy doing the research and doing all the writing 10 page papers because like as a theater major you don't really get a lot of you don't get to do a lot of the academic things like that but I also realized how much the two fields kind of come together I mean like we're talking classics like Greece is the birth of theater birthplace of theater um, I was able to get them to come together with like ancient warfare and stage combat so it's been it's been a fun time in the department um, yeah, it was a super interesting class. Um, luckily, I had already taken two ancient Near East classes before, one with um, Professor Savage, so it was kind of nice to, you know, get all that same information and find new new, new things, um, new patterns, and surveying all the different sites and trying to draw these connections. Um, and also, just the ancient Near East region, um, I'm a Kurdish-American, so that region is just a, has a special tie with um, my ancestry, so it's always interesting to see like the different evidence and seeing the different connections that kind of shows. So yeah. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. What I'm getting at is that the ritual madness of the main acts that we see in the play is not kind of this senseless, random hysteria as it's very kind of commonly seen. Um, it's actually more of a reversal of coming age rituals and the bloodshed that they cause in uh, killing animals and men alike is almost a reversal of the bloodshed that comes with becoming a woman in the ancient world um, and Dionysus uses this and is very intentional in this to reveal the anxieties of the men of Thebes in what they fear for their women and also to expose their own hypocrisy and the way that they mistreated his own mother. So what is the Bacchae, for those of you who haven't read it? It's a play written by Euripides. It was first um, performed in uh, 406 BCE, one year after his death, um, at the Great Dionysian Festival. Um, it was put on by and administrated by his son, also named Euripides. Um, and it is basically the establishment myth of the tradition of the uh, Dionysian cult in Thebes specifically, but uh, more broadly, the tradition of uh, made out of rituals, which is where a group of women followers of Dionysus would basically retreat to the mountains for a few days, a week, and they would stay there and do these rituals, and men were very commonly not allowed to attend, and nobody really kind of knew what they did. Um, so this is kind of why were they doing this was the question that they were trying to ask, answer here. So to start, we want to talk about what coming of age looked like for women in ancient Greece. It was often associated with uh, their first childbirth or their first menstruation around 12 or 13, which is when most young Greek women were married, um, typically to much older men. And it was basically the transition from being kind of able to play and be kind of more or less free in their lives into the role of a mother wife running a household, taking care of a husband, taking care of children, um, and kind of being the administrator of all of these responsibilities. And so there were lots of rituals that were associated with this because it was very important to acknowledge the crossing of this boundary from girlhood into womanhood especially with women where it is so marked by bloodshed more or less so there was a ritual called the arteo which was uh, a ritual for artemis it was um in response to a myth regarding a young girl who was attacked by a bear and her brothers killed the bear which angered artemis very greatly and so in order to remedy this wrong that was done to her um and to kind of mark a passage out of Artemis's domain, which was around young women, uh, young girls would go into the forest and wear little to no clothing, and they would basically play act being the bear that was hunted by the brothers. And that was kind of one of the things that they would do before they were really considered like a woman marriageable age. Um, there was also the institution of the Kenephros, which was not always completely associated with coming of age, but in a lot of communities, it was kind of a rite of passage for young women, which was basically to institute the massage of a, an ideal maiden 
and she would basically lead a ritual procession, commonly at a festival of Dionysus, um, where she would lead the um, the sacrificial procession. She would have all the first fruits of the season in a gilded basket, commonly. Um, but there was also a ritual that was more common, and there isn't really a concrete name for it, but it's young women would typically have very long hair, and they would have lots of toys, so when they became a woman, they would cut their hair short, and they would dedicate their toys to the gods, typically to signify their transition from the domain of Artemis into the domain of Aphrodite. And so I kind of want to pose the Maenads and how they act and how they're depicted as how young women were commonly seen in ancient Greece specifically. So the Maenads have this long, <coughs> unbound hair with these crowns of leaves. They're all barefoot. They're wearing little to no clothing, mostly made of animal skin. So it's open garments, as you can see in this painting back here. Um, and young women, they all would typically have long hair. It was very uncommon for young girls to have short hair in ancient Greece. And it was very common for young women to wear metallic hair ornaments, like little um, strands of metal in their hair. Um, and typically older women would have short hair or be veiled or have it up in some way. It wouldn't just kind of be down. And um, young women would also commonly be wearing open garments like aprons, or particularly during the Artea, they would be wearing little to no clothing similar to the Maenads. Um, and so, and also the Maenads in the play are depicted as playing. That word is explicitly used, that they are playing in the forest, much like young women were allowed to play with small animals, with each other, they're braiding each other's hair, they're just kind of being girls. And so I wanted to highlight this passage from the, from the, middle of the Bacchae, uh, when we first really see the Maenads. Breast swollen with milk, new mothers who had left their babies behind at home nestled gazelles and young wolves in their arms, suckling them. One woman struck her thysis against a rock, and a fountain of cool water came bubbling up. Another drove her fennel in, in the ground, and where it struck the earth at the god's touch, a spring of wine poured out. Those who wanted milk scratched at the soil with bare fingers, and white milk came welling up, pure honey spurted, streaming from their wands. I wanted to highlight this passage because this nestling of young animals, this nursing of young animals is so commonly seen with young women, even now, like we see girls love little tiny animals. But it was also, we see this act as a mother, um, a, more as a biological need to get this out of them than acting as an actual parent to these um, young animals. And I also wanted to highlight the fact that they were drinking milk, they were nursing from the earth, uh, kind of bringing them back to their own childhood where they would have been primarily drinking milk and honey and water and honestly very little wine. Um, and so once the, the men of Thebes, they're aware that all of the women in the village have just left. They've up and left their homes, they've left their families, they've left their husbands kind of more or less in a lurch because no one's there to take care of the children, no one's there to take care of the husbands. And so they are, many of the men are very convinced that the women have left and they're up in the mountains being promiscuous and doing all of these really like awful things and really just debasing themselves from the kind of good chaste family women that they were expected to be. And so they started trying to more or less hunt down these women and bring them home to their families to basically reinstate their chastity and make sure that they're remaining these chaste, loyal family women uh, so that they, they don't ruin their reputations and their families. And so Dionysus actually convinces Pentheus, the king of Thebes, to dress as a woman um, to because he is so sure that the Maenads are in the mountains doing just all of these awful things and his mother is there and he wants his mother back. He wants his mother to come back. And so Dionysus tells him, well, if you dress as a woman, you can go see them and you can go see that like, they're not doing anything wrong. And he's like, okay, yeah, sure. They're not doing anything wrong. I'll see that myself. I know that they are. So I will dress up as a woman and go watch them. And many soldiers, um, 
shepherds in the mountains, they see these women and they want to bring them back to satisfy the king. And so they go after the Maenads, which is something that I will get into the consequences of this in a moment. Um, but I did want to highlight what coming of age meant for young men in Greece. It was often considered the transition from being under the control of a woman, their mother, into being in power over women and being the head of the household, being a leader. And they became more or less the guardians of women's chastity, which is why this was so important for them to maintain the chastity of their wives, mothers, daughters, um, the women in the village, because it was their societal obligation to do this. And I also wanted to highlight the, um, the comparison between the Maenads and Semele, Dionysus' mother. So the Maenads, even though we know they're in the mountains, they're playing, they're braiding each other's hair, they're cradling animals, and they're not doing anything to anybody else, they are perceived by the men of Thebes as unchaste, as dirty, as unclean, as problematic, even though they are empirically doing nothing wrong. They have this very clear image of what is happening there, even though they can't even see it for themselves. And suddenly, much like this, so when she was impregnated by Zeus, she went to her village and she said, I am pregnant and I'm going to have this baby and it will be a god, it will be Dionysus, and it is the child of Zeus. And she was ostracized by her community. No one believed her. She was considered a whore, they refused to believe it, and his mother was more or less stolen from him by their idea that she was not chaste, that she was not good enough to be a wife and a mother and respected in the community. And so the Maenads are able to kind of take this power back for themselves through bloodshed, the same bloodshed that brought them into womanhood uh, through menstruation or through childbirth, which menstruation was also considered to have supernatural properties in ancient Greece. It was considered specifically by Pliny the Elder, if a nude menstruating woman was just existing, she actually had the power to subvert natural disasters. Um, it's not clear why they thought this, but it was the common belief. Um, and so the Maenads were completely peaceful until they're confronted by men who wish to stop them. There are actually instances of men in the play who are very accepting of this. They just think it's kind of fun and they're like, oh look, it's so cool. And they're completely unharmed. And so they rend and tear these men to pieces. They literally tear them limb from limb, which is very much in parallel to the tearing that often happened through unmedicated and unsupervised labor that was often very, very hard on these women. And so Pentheus, the primary perpetrator of the violence, is torn limb from limb in their attempt to protect themselves, and they see him as an animal, not a man. They see him as a threat. And so these are my sources. And I want to thank Dr. Rafa for helping me so much in this and all of you for attending this one. We have uh, Tanya Rashisa, um, who is a sophomore uh, English major and recently a classics and archaeology uh, major. She's just declared. And we're very fortunate to have her in the department. Um, Tanya started working on this project in my uh, ancient comedy course. Um, she wrote a series of really fantastic short essays about ancient comic writers like Aristophanes, uh, Terence Plautus, um, but um, she's also an avid reader of Shakespeare, uh, and so she has been working on this project to find traces of uh, the ancient Roman comic writers in uh, Shakespeare's plays. Um, so I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing this talk. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Tanya. Um, as Dr. Radcliffe said, I took ancient comedy with him last fall, in this, uh, last yeah, fall, and today I'll be presenting about Shakespeare and Roman New Comedy. Now on to the man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Uh, William Shakespeare was born in 1564 in Stratford-upon-Avon, in England. His birthday is actually coming up soon, April 23rd. But anyway, not much is known about his life, but we do know for a fact that his father was town bailiff, and because of his father's occupation, he was able to attend the local grammar school at Stratford, much likely for free. 
So the school curriculum had an intense emphasis on the Latin classics. Like in other Elizabethan grammar schools, Latin was the primary language of learning. And the study of Latin authors like Cicero, Ovid, and Virgil would have been the focus of his literary training. Shakespeare went on to write over 39 plays and 150 sonnets in his lifetime. However, not all elements of Shakespearean drama can or originated with the bard himself. Shakespeare likely drew inspiration from the dramatists that came before him, especially Roman comic playwrights like Plautus and Terence, which is unsurprising given the fact that he would have read uh, and even acted in their plays while he was still at school. One of Shakespeare's earliest comedies, called The Comedy of Errors, is primarily based on the play Menechmi by Plautus. In the comedy we'll be looking at today, The Taming of the Shrew, we'll see how Shakespeare <laughs> utilizes new comedic conventions, such as thought characters. And just to add further confirmation that Shakespeare would have been familiar with Plautus and his work, in the tragedy of Hamlet, the character of Polonius says to the prince, Seneca cannot be too heavy, nor Plautus too light. So Taming of the Shrew is set in Padua, Italy, around the time of the Renaissance. A young man named Lucentio is in love with Bianca, the daughter of the rich merchant Baptista, but he cannot marry Bianca until her shrewish older sister Katharina, or Kate for short, marries. And Patricia, an adventurer from Verona, agrees to woo Kate so he can gain a rich dowry. He then uses a number of tactics to tame Kate and render her an obedient wife. Simultaneously, Lucentio, with the help of his servant Tranio, who is important to remember for later on, courts Bianca. And the play ends with Patricio marrying Kate and Lucentio marrying Bianca. To be frank, the play hasn't aged very well, but it has been made into several adaptations, like the 1967 film starring Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, as well as the 1999 romantic comedy, 10 Things I Hate About You. But more importantly, one of the stock characters frequently found in Roman comedy that Shakespeare uses in the play is the Calidus Servus, or the clever servant. His task is always the same, which is to help out a lovesick young man slash master by creating and acting out a tricky and deceitful scheme. He also acts as a surrogate father in place of his young master's his absent one. The character Tranio, Lucentio as a servant, is an example of this trip. In a plotist play called Mausoleria or Haunted House, there is also a character named Tranio, who is also a clever servant. So both trainers use their clever wit to get their young masters and themselves out of difficult situations. In Taming of the Shrew, Trainia suggests that Lucentio play schoolmaster to court Bianca, and Trainia will then pretend to be Lucentio. While Lucentio is off already courting Bianca himself, Trainio, masquerading as Lucentio, <laughs> seeks Patipsis, her father's permission, to court Bianca, and he ends up outbidding another one of Bianca's suitors, Hermia. In Plautus' haunted house, Tranio, who is a slave, comes up with a scheme to convince his young master's his father, the properties that their house is haunted. This is because Philolochus, the young master, has borrowed a large sum of money to free his slave girl, Philomantium, and for partying with his friends, all without his father's knowledge. In the end, Tranio gets caught, but instead of getting punished, he is granted many missions. In the first scene of Taming of the Shrew, we get a sense of what Tranio and Lucentio's dynamic is like. Lucentio tells Tranio, I burn, I pine, I perish, Tranio, if I achieve not this young, modest girl. And he's talking about Bianca. Counsel me, Tranio, for I know thou can. Assist me, Tranio, for I know thou will. Then Tranio replies, Master, it is no time to chide you now. Affection is not rated from the heart. If love have touched you, not remains but so. Uh, I don't want to butcher the Latin, but that last line translates to regain your freedom at the lowest cost, which is actually a direct quote from another ancient Roman comedy, The Eunuch by Terence. And in Haunted House, we can see how Tranio serves the same role as his namesake in Shakespeare's play, when through pro Theo Properties, the father, arrives back home early without announcement. Philolochus, his son, panics, but Tranio tells him to be brave and that he'll medicate his misery with but another um, stock character that Shakespeare uses in the play is the Miles Gloriosus, or the braggart soldier. He is loud, arrogant, and boastful, but gullible as well. And he is often selfish and misogynistic. The character's title is taken from a play of the same name by Plotus. In the play, the braggart soldier's name is Pyrgo Polynices, 
who says things like, how wretched to be such a handsome man like me. In Shakespeare's Henry IV, there is a character named Sir John Falstaff who embodies the role, who, fun fact, was Queen Elizabeth I's favorite Shakespeare character. But the braggart soldier in Taming of the Shrew is none other than Patricio himself. He is loud, stubborn, and boisterous, which makes him a braggart soldier. He is overly confident in his ability to exercise male dominance over Kate. And he is aggressive towards his servants and very misogynistic towards his wife. As he says, I will be master of what is mine own. Kate is my goods, my chattels, she is my house, my household stuff, my field, my barn, my horse, my ox, my ass, my anything. However, he has some redeeming qualities, although very few. For example, he doesn't care about what other people think about Kate um, and about his marriage to her, which isn't enough to redeem him for some people, and I would have to agree. But <laughs> another fun fact, in the early 1600s, a playwright named John Felcher, who was a frequent collaborator and contemporary of Shakespeare, wrote a sequel to the play called The Tamer Tame, where Patricio himself is tamed by a new wife. So evidence suggests that Shakespeare absorbed much of what was taught in his grammar school, um, especially the comedies. And stock characters and archetypes are key features of Roman New Comedy, and Shakespeare incorporated them in his comedies, like in Taming of the Shrew. And in reading and writing fiction today, we want our characters to feel real and tangible and not stereotypical, but stock characters like the braggart soldier and the clever servant were easily recognizable to an ancient audience and almost always guaranteed to make them laugh. So, oh, here's the sisters are you? Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, actually, we have a bit of time for questions, also for Clara. Um, so if anyone wants to ask about, uh, about either uh, presentation or both. My question is for Tanya, do you have a favorite Shakespeare play and favorite Roman comedy? Um, I think my favorite Shakespeare play has to be King Lear, or either King Lear or Hamlet. And my favorite ancient, Ro wait, ancient Roman comedy, it's probably Haunted House. Clara, I was, I was wondering, I mean, what do you think about the, the violent, catastrophic ending of Bacchae? Um, do you think that it's basically a judgment against the, the kind of patriarchal attitudes of, of Pentheus? Uh, or do you, do you think that it's kind of hard to decide uh, what, the, what the ultimate message is? I think it's hard to decide what the ultimate message is because I do feel like a lot of it may have been unintentional on Pentheus' part. Um, because I don't really think that he was ready to dissect the patriarchy of Greece and because it was so baked into the worldview. But I also, I, I like to read it as kind of a judgment on he kind of got what he deserved for being judgmental and unjust. Um, so I would have to agree personally, but I'm not sure if you're a piece of it. <laughs> So um, I would ask you though to historicize this, right? Where, when is the play performed? At what time and what is happening in Athens at the time? So that's the first thing to consider, right? So this is his last play. So what do you think he was trying to say after a whole century of Greek tragedy where you had mythical themes and this time you have Dionysus, the god of theater, coming and asserting his power at the end of the century and at the end of democratic Athens. So what do you think about that? I do think that that does lend me to have a little bit more faith in his intention. However, I do think that some of it, maybe it's because I feel that my argument is a little bit stretched over my own reading of the Baca. <laughs> Um, but I, I do think that, yes, it, it is a judgment against kind of removing power and reality from what is happening and making judgments against the people for things that are just inherently not true and not really letting them have their own say and making these 
kind of autocratic decisions of they are being a chase, even though it's not true, and so I must do something about it and kind of over <coughs> power. I think it makes a lot more sense like within the context of like you know, Democrat Athens is over. However, I do think that it is still very much within that kind of locket of worldview of these very kind of set roles. And I don't really think he was kind of trying to dissect it and examine what these roles were and what they meant, kind of as much as I'm kind of reading into it, more or less. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Dimitri. Um, as Dr. Fire said, I am a film production major and a screenwriter, and also class in archaeology is my minor. Um, and I'm very, very passionate about you know ancient history and ancient world and the stories that come out of there. And um, I grew up in Cyprus, and so Greek cinema has a very, very strong influence on me as a filmmaker. And one of, I would say, the most prominent, uh, you know, filmmaking movements right now that comes out of Greece is known as Greek Weird Wave. And I'm going to be talking to you about how Greek Weird Wave and ancient Greek tragedy intersect, and how filmmakers like Yoros Panthimos actually, you know, take those stories and readapt them into the modern world. Uh, so, like a little bit about what Greek Weird Wave is, uh, it's a relatively new movement that originates around 20 years ago. Although some some people attribute it attribute the beginning of this movement to like 1980s and 1970s. So, the Greek Weird Wave refers to the emergence of subversive brand of films um, that ex explore political and cultural issues in very unsettling ways. Um, it's largely the result, the result of the Greek economic crisis that started in uh, late 2000s, and um, it essentially projects whatever is happening to Greece um, <coughs> into film in a very, very unsettling and almost like theatrical ways. Most of those directors that work uh, in this in this movement they come from theater, uh, and one of those uh, one of the biggest filmmakers that essentially popularized this movement. Is Yorgos Lanthimos, and he brought uh, Greek Weird Wave to the, you know, uh, global global scale. So yeah, Yorgos Lanthimos is a Greek film director, producer, screenwriter, photographer, and theater director. Uh, he started his career in commercials and theater, so a lot of his films are very very influenced um, by that. And um, yeah, he's he's. Uh, his first couple of films are in Greek, and then his last four films are in English. And um, he's most well known for um, his films like uh, The Lobster, that he got the original screenplay for in the Academy Awards. And he got also nominated for Best Director and Best Picture in 2018 of his film The Favorite. And this is a quote by him that I really, really liked because I feel like it really encapsulates the spirit of the Greek Weird Wave. So he said that it's true that there are younger uh, people making films and there are different kinds of films. This has created some attention in what's coming out of Greece, and people like to find a way to name this as a new ethnic cinema. But it's not like there's a movement or a common philosophy in making these films. There are just things that happen, and now people are paying attention to it. And I just feel like it's very, very true to what these films are all about, because essentially there's no one unified idea that, oh, we want to start making those weird films. It's rather like an intrinsic response from you know filmmakers from the artists of our generation that just kind of try to encapsulate the world that surrounds them um, with their films. And so the film that I will you know I wrote my paper about and I'll be talking to you about today is The Killing of a Sacred Deer. Has anyone seen that? Yeah. So uh, it's a great film. It's one of his later films um, released in 2017. Uh, it's an English speaking film starring Nicole Kidd and Colin Farrell and uh, Barry Keegan. And uh, the brief synopsis is there's basically this like a heart surgeon called Stephen Murphy, um, who has like seemingly a perfect life, although there's some really weird and awful thing about the world that he exists in and his family. Um, and there's this character um, called Martin, who just, you know, this weird kid that follows him around. And there's a really weird kind of like platonic father-son relationship between them although uh, Martin is not part of, of his family. Um, and then suddenly we find out that, you know, um, it's not a spoiler, but um, 
there's there's something weird started happening to the health of his whole family. Uh, his the health started deteriorating, and uh, you know, essentially, can I spoil it for you a little bit? A little bit. Uh, but essentially, uh, Doctor Steven is you know involved in um, the death of um, of Martin's father because he uh, performed a surgery on him while being drunk, and so it's essentially Martin's. Divine retribution that um, affected health of his family. I'm not going to spoil the ending, but we could, we could, sorry. Uh, but I'm going to be talking to you about how you know um, Doctor Steven essentially has to make a choice at some point in the movie, where he has to sacrifice something uh, from his family, and this is related to uh, the myth of the killing of the sacred deer, the deer and Hygenia, uh, and so. Um, in this myth, uh, King Agamemnon is uh, persecuted by goddess Artemis because he killed a sacred deer uh, during one of the hunts. And so now he is um, he's in the Trojan War, he's in this place called Aulides, and uh, he's about to sail like, his ships to go to Troy. However, he can't do it because the wind uh, is not blowing, and he's wondering what the hell is going on. And he finds out that goddess Artemis is very, very upset with him because he killed his sacred deer, and now he needs to, you know, make a sacrifice to uh, retribute himself and atone himself for what he has done. Uh, one of the most famous um, reiterations of this myth we see in the uh, in the play by Euripides called Iphigenia at Aulis, and uh, it essentially tells the story of Iphigenia coming to. Um, to the, the work on the Agamemnon, and um, essentially him deciding to sacrifice her in order to, you know, replace um, replace the sacred deer of Artemis, and so um, you know, essentially this myth is referred to in the in the name of the year response in the Blunt and Mrs. film, and in my paper I was trying to investigate why did he decide to to choose this title, and uh, apart from the narrative uh, of the actual film. And here's just like some research question that I was asking myself um, is like uh, how, like my, my main research question essentially was how does Yorgos Lanthimos reinterpret this Greek uh, <coughs> tragedy and convention and applies it to, to his film. And you know, the, the kind of big conclusion that I came to and I framed my paper about is this idea of like divine retribution. So in ancient Greece, uh, there was a very, very clear set of like laws that the society and the people were supposed to abide to, and those laws were essentially related to the deities and the gods that they worship. And in all those plays and myths, there was a very clear idea, it's like, if you break this law, there's something that's gonna happen to you. But however, we live in a society today where we don't believe in gods or you know any sort of like divine retribution <laughs> on a global scale as much anymore. Uh, however, I guess what Lanthimos was trying to, you know, project in his film is that there is a certain moral compass and there is a certain things that people should do and should not do and there's still a very you know different way of divine retribution um, that comes to when you break those kind of laws and yeah there's a lot of other themes um, that I guess he like, compares to contrasts in, in, in the film with the original play for example, like family, how you know we have an idea of like a Western nuclear family now, and what is the structure that we're like? Is it the father who is making all the decisions? Is it the father who needs to choose who to sacrifice um, versus to how we had a family like in the ancient world, especially a royal family like Agamemnon, um, where you know he's the one making decisions um, no matter what. But so yeah, this was essentially my paper. Uh, thank you for listening, and let me know if you have any questions. So, how oh. does... Oh. <coughs> Sorry, you go. Yeah, I have a, a quick one. What do you make of the artificiality of how everyone speaks in the film? Because it's somewhat stilted. Do you view it as maybe just uh, Lantimos trying to be strange, or... Do you think it's an echo of anything in the Euripidean and tragedy? Well, I, I think first of all, it's his, uh, you know, it's his background in theater, and I guess that's that comes to the whole idea of like, what Greek weird wave is all about. 
I guess it's just how he sees the world and how he like sees speech and communication. For him, I guess in all of his films, it feels a little bit forced and almost like restrained. But there is like some truth in the very very simple interactions between characters. I feel like it's very theatrical because it's very I feel like to how people to speak nowadays. But it's also not not <coughs> as authentic. Uh, so it's like a combination of both, I guess, like his theatrical background and also how he sees the world around him and how people are often interacting. Yeah, so I wanted to relate the film more to Lankumo's work and especially to the financial crisis. And what is weird about the film is that the young boy becomes the kind of uh, divine deus ex machina that um, uh, brings this retribution on, on the surgeon. So why do you think that, uh, what is the um, relevance perhaps of the financial crisis and the Greek tragedy in the retelling of that story? Because Lanthimos is always making choices that are related to specific themes. Yes, so I, I think the, the biggest part for me is like the younger generation of Greece right now mm -hmm. is very, very like fed up and there's a sense of like this anxiety and anger that comes to the government mm -hmm. that I feel like became very, very prevalent in the financial crisis. Uh, there was a lot of protests and younger people were killed. So I feel like this, on, on one hand, it might be his way of like representing this angst of the younger generation that kind of finally gets the divine retribution of an older generation of the older established structures. Um, but it's also, I, I think it's also just him trying to, um, you know, to show that eventually there's going to be someone, someone to get you for, you know, yeah. for a reason. Good. So like something hopeful, I guess, that he's trying to establish. Well, that these people that are responsible will come to pay for what Yeah, done, in one way or another. Yeah. Good. Good job. Hi, um, I'm Sage. I'm talking about the not great crowd, not Google that. Um, a Mesopotamian erotic ideal that just means naked woman in German, which I learned a little too late in the class. Um, so, kicking us off, the, uh, many fall prey to the temptation of relying on the materiality and factuality of gender in the pursuit of woman and antiquity. And so, as such, much of our historical information is gleaned through the material culture. Um, however, sex and gender are cultural constructs, these are ideological fantasies and neither of which can be portrayed in an objective manner, nor understood through historical records and archeological facts. Following uh, Judith Butler's idea that gender is a performance, I believe that gender is performed through these representations for its consumption and its subsequent reproduction. As a result, the research of cultural conceptions of femininity has been increasingly fruitful thanks to depictions of women on tablets, uh, stone monuments, and other such objects. So this is the main kind of depiction. Um, this project focuses on a corpus of an almost always identical iconography of a nude woman from Mesopotamia in the third to first millennium BCE. I've identified this figure as an unidentified ideological conception of woman, an expression of eroticism not unlike those we consume today. In visual representations, the body is viewed as a symbol. In the Mesopotamian arts, the female nude is a symbol of sexuality. Representations do not merely reflect reality, but contribute to the establishment of gendered norms and finding what gender is. This female figure is a cultural construct of femininity, participating in defining womanhood, what it looks like to be a woman in Mesopotamian antiquity. Similarly, sexual differences identified and created by discursive activities, like the production of representations, and the naked body has functioned as one of the major visual mediums for establishing gender differentiation. In the case of the Mesopotamian nude, the differences in male to female representations reinforce a time old narrative in which women are reduced to their sexuality while men transcend theirs to represent society and the human condition. What I most wish to highlight about my argument, though, is that the sexuality that women are reduced to is not inherently reproductive, which deviates from this normative interpretation of women as solely vessels of fertility. Um, this project does not challenge the long standing association between womanhood and sexuality, but instead explores it as an equality form. Um, a sexuality in which it may be viewed as pleasurable and desirable. This is in no way implying that ancient Mesopotamian women had complete equality with males, or any at all, but it suggests that the patriarchal culture of the time placed a greater emphasis on erotic sexuality rather than the capacity to reproduce. The nude woman... Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, there we go. The nude woman has been one of the most frequently portrayed figures in art from the Paleolithic all the way up to the present day. Artists and craftspeople from every culture have been drawn to depicting her, and as a result, she is one of the most popular subjects of our collective imagery. 
No different for the Mesopotamians, the standing nude woman is the earliest design element in Mesopotamian art and has attained iconic significance in her appearance. This image predominated over other imagery on the first mold-made plaques of the Akkadian era um, and was the most common motif in the pinnacle of plaque production in the old Babylonian period. This particular plaque, dating between 2350 and 2150 BCE, was discovered in Larsa and offers a representation of the mass production of clay renderings of the female form during this era. The conventional interpretation of these portrayals has asserted that they represent fertility and mother goddesses, irrespective of the absence um, of evident deity characteristics or designations. The action of presenting the breasts in the open display of sexual organs has been seen as the obvious reference to the reproductive capacity of female bodies. One theory has proposed that these plaques may have been linked to the maturation of young women, after which they were ceremonially smashed. Um, a less prevalent theory proposes that this depiction symbolized temple prostitutes affiliated with the Ishtar cult. I follow the explanation provided by Graf that such an interpretation makes fertility the excuse for sexual display in a manner that speaks much more to modern prudishness than to the historical moment. No evidence suggests that the Nocte Frau has any connection to fertility cults, cults of holy prostitution, or secular prostitution. And again, I think that this speaks to the way that we need to explain female sexuality. There has to be some rational or religious reason for its expression. Um, and furthermore, this representation of this figure appears to follow the erotic traditions of Mesopotamia, as I'm going to show through the literary and visual record. The female figure is not just attractive as an expression of the female form, she is also actively seductive. Her hands are positioned to lean emphasis to her breasts, which is inviting the viewer to assess her sexual attributes. This figure is devoid of her own context, with little to no indication of the physical region or location in which she stands. The focus of her event is on the presentation of her sexuality. The Nocte Frau image focuses on the female body, emphasizing her gender physical differences through nudity. Her absence of clothing is deliberate, as garments of the arts at this time served as important markers of identification and representational context of the figure. Her nudity functions to universalize her as a simple man, devoid of any social signifier. So then she becomes an ideal of a woman, not a historical woman or a goddess, um, and her sexual worth is regarded as pleasurable rather than procreative. No. Okay, there we go. Uh, Mesopotamian art has long depicted naked bodies for symbolic and realistic purposes. Nudity is significant in a clothing-wearing culture, and so it functions in a multitude of forms in their imagery. It's used to express status and gender, nakedness as a sign of er, deprivation, humiliation, and death, practical or functional nakedness, erotic nudity, and the use of unclothed, unclothed bodies for ritual and or symbolic reasons. The image of the Nocte Frau denotes erotic nudity, where the naked body evokes desire, stimulates pleasure, or is the sexual object. Nudity was used to convey femininity, sexual attraction, and kuzbe, which is the Akkadian word for seductive appeal. The structural basis of her genre of imagery is the portrayal of a stylized, anatomically constructed human body, where her sexual iconic power is based on the absolute value of her nudity. Um, that is, there is a differentiation of nakedness and nudity in Mesopotamian imagery. Um, Asher Grieve and Sweeney claim that figures depicted naked also appear clothed in identical contexts. Uh, to some extent, showing them naked was optional, and the alternative of clothedness was considered an inherent feature of nakedness. However, the nude was not optional as an everlasting ontological archetypical shape. Its significance was dependent on it. Thus, the Nocte Frau's nudity is a purposeful artistic choice, since clothes were a crucial means of self-representation and contextualization. As a result, her lack of clothing serves to further establish her as a figure divorced from any cultural markers and further the interpretation of her as an erotic nude. Um, she's never been clothed in any of her manifestations, and so her erotic power is rooted in this archetypical nudity. There is no alternative of clothedness for her. She is not in a state of undress because that would imply a transitory quality. She is a nude, and it is this characteristic of nudity that imbues her with sexual desirability. In Mesopotamian representations, female nudity is frequently represented in scenes of copulation, not because the plaques realistically depict the act, but because nudity signifies seduction and temptation. It is a visual method of evoking desire. The nude female body possesses a potent attraction that provokes male passion. Her form alone holds a seductive power that can make men act on their lust, possibly even against their own will. 
Literature reiterates ad nauseum that the sight of female nudity provokes strong sexual arousal, which can be observed in the stories of Enlil and Ninlil and the Epic of Gilgamesh. The sexuality of the Nongde crowd transcends reproductive essentialism and is expressed as a mode of eroticism that appears to have been deeply valued in Mesopotamian society. <coughs> Since the body is the location where gender is visually differentiated, the interpretation of this figure as a depiction of female sexuality becomes clear when evaluating the related genre of male nudity. Female nudity was always associated with sexuality, and in particular with extreme sexual desire, Akkadian Khuzbu. However, male nudity had several connotations in the past. I want to first start by pointing out that the nude male figure is not depicted in the epiphallic position that's prevalent elsewhere in ancient art. We see male genitalia shown in the depiction of the male nude, however, there has never been an erect penis portrayed in his imagery. The scarcity of phallic symbolism is visible in the archaeological remains, too, where nude male figures or phallic symbols are rarer than naked females or vulgar portrayals. However, the epiphallic position is depicted in plaques of moral sexual celebration which are conceptually distinct from conceptions of procreation. As such, we understand that the epiphallic position is a signifier of sexuality. As a result, the omitted phallus in the nude male category leads me to reject that these other nude male figures are expressions of fertility or virility. A survey of the arts of Mesopotamia showed that the incorporation of erotic components distinguishes erotic from mundane portrayals. So we can conclude that the absence of these features distinguishes the genre of nude as distinctly de-eroticized. Um, so not only is the male nude divorced from sexuality, but he transcends it to represent humanity. The female nude is physical and sexualized, while male nudity had varied implications. Unlike the Nocte Frau, the male nude is not represented in frontal isolation, but is constantly in motion. He does not exist for the appraisal and observation. He does not exist to be seen, but is seeing and doing. The male nude has an element of autonomy that the female nude is deprived of. It doesn't matter if he is a hero or a prisoner of war, he is still active in life. The nude woman is con or contained to a portrait of sexuality. Um, the male nude appears in narrative scenarios that necessitate a state of undress, such as religious engagements or any other practical considerations, such as swimming, like we see here. In Mesopotamian artwork from the third to second millennia, naked men appear in a variety of contexts. We see heroes in competitions, cultic officiants, and priests. In the middle register of the cultic narrative of the work of these, which you can see right there, um, we observe a group of naked men bearing baskets of food as offerings to the goddess Hanana. Mesopotamian imagery characterizes men by sexual markers such as beards or nakedness, and so we observe here that the bodies of men are marked with both indicators of gender, sociocultural and anatomical. While they are sexually differentiated through anatomical markers of gender, their nudity is cultic and uneroticized, as indicated by the placidity of the phallus. Male nudity may also serve further iconographic function in narratives relating to masculine potency and valor. Nudity in this example displays manly power and heroism, which is another form of Khuzbu, rather than being a religious obligation. However, the hero's genitalia are either minimized or omitted, demonstrating the lack of sexual connotations associated with the feminine Khuzbu. Throughout the Akkadian era, the connection between nudity, death, and loss was explicitly exploited as a narrative technique in depictions of war, allowing the audience to predict the conclusion of the Canon. So you can see that um, over on the right side. <coughs> in the visual representations of Mesopotamia, there is a clear differentiation in the iconographic function of female and male nudity. The tradition of interpreting or interpretation for Mesopotamian nude females focuses on them as fertility fetishes or mother deities, symbolizing some type of reproductive desire. However, this completely ignores Mesopotamian frameworks of sexuality and desire, reinforcing fallacious and often Western notions that fertility was the only important attribute of female sexuality. The Mesopotamian evidence does not support the traditional separation of fertility and sexuality, seen in archaeological and art historical interpretations. In actuality, sexual activity was intended to be enjoyed for its pleasure and not necessarily for reproduction alone, which we see by the um, fact that they've discovered contraceptives from the time, so we know that they were having solely um, pleasurable sex, or at least not for the intention of reproduction. Um, some scholars have posited that the Nocte Frau was created explicitly for the pleasure of men. Um, the scholar Mori suggests that the increase in masculinization that occurred during the early 2nd century was the cause of the widespread depiction of nude women in terracotta's normal time period. Images of the nude woman may have been displayed for the male gaze, as the modes of gender representation exhibit a certain male bias in depictions of nude women. Irani claims that the Nocte Frau was part of a genre of the female body 
provocatively displayed for the viewer's consumption, in which the woman is validated as the object of visual consumption as the non-divine essence of femininity. Her suggestion finds of reproductive essentialism, and what are the implications of an ideal that values eroticism over procreation? I think it opens doors to wonder about the cultural currency of female sexuality at this time, um, and new ways of redefining women in histories that they were excluded from. So that is my presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I apologize if this is out of your like, research scope, but do you think your interpretation should force us to question other cultures' representation? Because I just kept thinking of the like Socratic folded arm figurines, how it's often just assumed to be fertility because of the pubic triangle. What do you think Absolutely. about that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I yeah. When I was doing all of my readings, like a big thing is that we, because Western art is so popular and Western art interpretations are so popular. I think that we apply that a lot, especially when it comes to like beauty standards. I was reading this one piece and this author said something that was really true that was like, are these fertility figures or could the West just never conceive that like a body unlike the Venus is considered beautiful, you know? And so I think that was, it, again, we never know at the end of the day, um, but I think it just opens new doors for exploration and finding deeper meaning. And I mean, I'm a gender studies double major, so a lot of what I do is not saying things for fact, I'm just adding to the conversation and opening new doors to explore. So yeah, thank you, that was a great question. Thank you. So, uh, so here we go. We'll get to learn about a great site in uh, modern day Israel called Tel Beit Mira. And let me just slide show this from the start. There we go. Thank you, Professor Kessler. All right, so we're gonna go right back to where we started at the Sea of Galilee with Sean. Uh, so if you remember those pictures from the very first presentation, that's the kind of environment we're talking about. This is a nice place. Um, I wanted to focus my research on the site of Talbot Yara in particular because I'm fascinated by population movements and uh, ideas of cultural identity and how that discourse was existed in the ancient world. Um, and Talbot Yara presents a particular case in which um, there's controversy where in later eras of the early Bronze Age, we can tell that there is clearly two separate material cultural traditions on the site, and there is debate as to whether that signifies an actual separate identity of people living at the site, or if it's just the presence of the material. And a lot of this also has to do with the whole dynamic between sedentism and pastoralism, because this second group of people that may or may not have lived alongside the original inhabitants of the site are often identified as pastoralists. And so we like, the whole dynamic between sedentism and pastoralism is complicated, and in a lot of more traditional narratives, it's often oversimplified as like a direct like dichotomy between you're either sedentary or pastoral. And the reality is that, like most things, it's a spectrum, and there's all kinds of things in between. And I think that Israel Finkelstein has a great quote about this. He says, although usually scholars divide the desert population into two segments, pastoral nomads and sedentary groups, the nomad, the nomad sedentary continuum is much more com complex, composed of diverse and changeable socioeconomic situations, such as sedentary elements, agro-pastoralists, pastoralists who engage in occasional dry farming, pure pastoral nomads, etc. So you have all kinds of stuff along this range. And the other thing to keep in mind when it comes to sedentary and pastoral populations is that pastoral populations are harder to track in the archeological record because they generally leave far, far less um, like um, monumental kind of remains, long standing stuff. Um, and as I was saying, it's a spectrum though. So you do get like on the far end of people leaving monumental kind of architecture. We have the Nawamis that um, Miles talked about earlier in the Sinai. Uh, this isn't the area that I'm talking about, but it's just to show you that there is some range here and that migratory people sometimes do leave stuff behind. So Talbot Yara, like I said, is um, it's located right here where the Jordan River meets the Sea of Galilee. Um, it's pretty much like an ideal location for trade, so it's not surprising that in the early Bronze Age, which is when we're seeing some of like the first real um, recognizable like urbanization happening that this is like one of the foremost sites in the area. Um, the Arabic word is Kirbet Kara, so a lot of the times the um, the material that I'm going to be talking about today is referred to as Kirbet Karakware, which is very confusing, but just it's the same site. 
Um, it was continuously occupied through the early Bronze Age, which is also fantastic for archaeologists because we have no gaps between the different eras. We can see the direct transition between different periods, so it makes for a very complete picture. Um, so, uh, like most archaeological sites, this site has its own um, timeline, and uh, so EB1A corresponds to what uh, the excavators deem period A and so on. Uh, each of these time frames is about roughly like 300-ish years, but for the purpose of my discussion today, the major ones to focus on are going to be period C, uh, in which we um, first see the migrant community appear, and period D. Or actually, no, never mind, sorry. Period C immediately before the migrants appear, and period D when we have their sudden appearance. So per periods A and B are not that important for this discussion. It is interesting just in the course of um, describing early urban development and that we can tell that it was, a, it was actually a much bigger site in the earlier times. It was sprawling and totally um, heterogeneous. There was no planning. All of the architecture is different. It's like not a coherent urban site yet. But by the time of period C, we do have like massive fortification efforts. Uh, there is, what's fascinating about period C actually is we can tell that they had the roads planned before they started building the houses. So not only did they totally just uh, abandon all earlier um, like houses and structures, they completely formatted the site before they started building. So we can tell that this is actually like a truly um, urban project at this point. And another interesting thing about this is that the material culture is very um, homogenous by this point. We have like a clear, there's only, there's two patterns. Talbot Yara has like on, being on the Galilee is kind of in between the northern and southern Levant, and so we see two different material traditions, but they both are associated with the Levant. They're not, not associated with an outside group. But, I don't know. I, I like this period because it does feel like just very much like you can see the formation of a city. Um, one of my favorite parts of this reconstruction is, if you can see here, there's this little rock with a hole in it, and that's actually your, for most of... <laughs> Ancient history, that's your average anchor, right? You just throw a rope in the hole and drop it. But the fact is that the anchor was found at the front of the gate and not by the port, which you know we would assume it would be found near the Galilee itself. And so Ralphie Greenberg and his team, who have done most of the excavation here, have actually hypothesized that that's something like, um, I don't know, like an emblem of the city, like some sort of Oh, but think of like the like the owl on Athenian shields, or like a lambda for Sparta, like like an identifying marker of the community. And then, and this is all very important to keep in mind because we get to period D, and we see a very drastic shift in the site. Um, so the most monumental building at Tel Yara is this granary up here. Granary. We don't really know what it was because it was never finished. Um, a lot of times, um, articles will just refer to it as the, the circles building, full of circles. Uh, because, and that just goes to show we really have no idea what this thing is. But it clearly was being built, and at some point its construction ceased, and then it became a refuse dump for this the sudden appearance of a new um, material culture, which is referred to as the Kirbat Karak Ware. Um, and that's where we get to the whole issue of pots don't equal people. So, uh, Kirbat Karak ware, which is this new ware that's identified, shows up in a huge pile in the Circles building, is connected to a greater material culture connected to the uh, Anatolian highlands in the Caucasus region. A lot of, like, we can see the material similarities between this, the greater Kuro-Araxes culture, which is spreading. This is a massive area. I mean, this is, we're going from modern Israel to Azerbaijan here in this big arc um, with a very consistent culture. And it's really fascinating to see that it's made it all the way down from a very different area to the Levant. Like, we're talking massive mountains and highlands up here. It's just a very different environment. And yet, even though it's so far removed from where it likely originated, we see a shocking degree of um, 
conservatism in the material culture. So these three, the two on uh, my right are, the two on my right and on the bottom are all from Talbed Yara. And this one in the top, uh, my left, is uh, from modern day Armenia. And so we can see like, despite how far these have been taken from each other, there is a kind of shocking amount of similarity. And we can even see like the kind of like line hash patterns on it here and here and then on the one far removed in Armenia. And what's, I don't know, I think this is particularly cool just because um, they look really nice, but a lot of this isn't actually paint. This is a method of firing the pottery, which is very specific in that you, you deprive it of oxygen when you fire it and it actually gives it that shiny color that, I don't know, I would think that was paint if I didn't know better. But this brings us to the bigger picture of the whole site and why I'm so interested in it. And this is a problem that has, that every archeologist is familiar with, the idea that pots don't equal people. And that we cannot assume that because we have material identified and associated with one culture that that actually definitively um, implies the presence of people identifying with that culture. Like you could have, for example, a, like, um, I don't know, you could be, um, in ancient Israel and have like an Egyptian pot. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're an Egyptian because you have Egyptian things. And so we come to this problem where the, the debate is whether we have an actual separate group of people moving in here or is just their culture coming in through trade or warfare or any other kind of means. And so Rafi Greenberg and his team have come up with a bunch of ways to try to circumvent this issue because it's, it's totally just makes it very hard to actually identify demographic shifts in population movements and stuff. And so what they've done is tried to look at some like lesser focused on ideas to try to identify like more like it's hard to describe, but like tra traditions learned over time. So like and actually identifying a separate community, doing things differently, not just having it, but actually using the space and the world around you in different ways. So they identify almost like a separate tradition of the use of space once once Talbot Yara is occupied by these two ma different material cultures. We see one half of the settlement, it's pretty sharp divide, um, uses a lot of open space and has specific places where they throw their refuse and stuff. And the other half of the community is doing most of their cooking and stuff indoors, unlike the other half. And they're just kind of throwing their garbage everywhere. So not only is there like a different tradition of how they use the space around them, the way that they and like get rid of waste is totally different too. Um, and we also see in their cookware, um, the Kierbeck Karakware is all designed to, for like, or we can tell that initially it was designed for the purpose of mobility, which supports the idea that this is maybe a migratory people that's come and settled in an urban environment and are just maintaining some level of conservatism in their material culture. The um, other thing that they look a lot at is how brownstone and chipstone, the way that like, it's, it seems ridiculous, but just the way that you hit stones together to make a certain shape, we can identify um, different traditions, like different ways of doing that in the strikes. And so this is far beyond my level of interpretation, but uh, I believe it's one through four and eight and nine are from the existing uh, culture from Carrion C, and five, six, and seven can be identified as all being from uh, a new population. Now, I cannot tell the difference between these, but I think it's fascinating that we can use this avenue potentially to identify um, an actual different uh, tradition rather than just a different, um, or just a common uniform material culture. And so for this site in general, I just, I think that it's um, great for not just the Levant, but like all of archaeology in the sense that I think that Rafi Greenberg and his team have really opened the door for what we can do with um, identifying different populations through this like method of trying to trace out different traditions of how you use the world around you rather than just the material culture. Um, and I think that it also goes to exemplify like that the, the sedentary pastoral dichotomy isn't as sharp as sometimes traditional narrative stress it is, and that the ancient Near East is a much more dynamic and 
adaptable place and that people weren't afraid to, you know, they might maintain some level of cultural uniformity, but they weren't, or in terms of their material culture, but they weren't afraid to try a new environment or put themselves in something new. Because this was clearly a, a new group of people that came into an existing urban environment and um, essentially hijacked it because um, no one, we don't know what happened, but period C uh, clearly had a downturn and they were not able to stop this new group of people coming in because they were the ones that started the circles building that all of the Kirbat Karak stuff ended up being in. It's a fascinating site in just so many ways and I think it just speaks to the dynamism of the age. Question? <laughs> Shams? Is there any evidence of like a destruction layer that they came? No destruction layer. That's why it's like it literally seems like these like the central authority and like after de developing like um, clearly some form of um, centralized urban government governance because they were making walls and doing tons of monumental stuff that you need like political control to do that kind of labor and stuff. Clearly, it wasn't there at the end, and because they they didn't fight it at all. There's no evidence. They literally just walked in and took it. So, no idea. What's actually fascinating is the cycle continues, and then this new group of people that Rafi Greenberg says is an actual new group of people that's come in seem to take over and unify a new urban culture, which then also collapses. Grant? So, does it seem that the original group of people really left, or that it's just a new dominant culture? Not even a new dominant culture, which is what I think is so fascinating, is like it seems rather sharply delineated um, in, on the site. Like I was saying, like there's a weird pattern where on one half of it, they're using space differently than they're using it on the other half of it. And they're disposing of waste differently and all just all kinds of different stuff. So clearly that, that initial population remained and their descendants maintained their traditions too. Um, I think what is also interesting is that the granary is clearly Egyptian in plan and conception. Mm. Um, that's how we can identify it. It's, it's something that we have in Egypt. There's mm -hmm. a, a dome-shaped, um, yeah, a dome-shaped uh, ceiling on the top. Um, have you read anything about maybe a connection to Egypt? So my Egyptian I have uh, overall, like early the Bronze Age, and then. Uh, you know, the I have not, but I would not be surprised if Egyptian contact was getting in close. Because, I mean, this is like the, the, you know, the major trade routes in the ancient Levant. You have like the, I think it's the King's Road, which mm -hmm. is the land route. And then you have the, the coastal route. And since those are really the, just the two main trade pathways, I would not be surprised if the Egyptians had contacts in both. Especially because, at least in Arad, for sure, there was some uh, connections with Egypt. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so, yeah. maybe it is uh, inspired by an Egyptian granary. I think the whole thing with, like, I try to avoid calling it a granary just because we're so uncertain what it is. It definitely well, looks I like a granary. It definitely but, looks like one. Yeah, the circle building. Okay, oh, we're going to get Yeah, there you go. All right, so for, yeah, for my paper, I tried to read create Sumerian beer, and we do have two different brews of Sumerian beer in the back for anyone who wants to try. Um, Alright, so just a little background. Uh, basically, so in Mesopotamia, this is where like the first cities and writing kind of evolved to the whole world, and as soon as we see writing develop, beer is already like, it's been going for a long time. It's not a new thing, it's a a big part of society. You have a lot of administrative texts that are talking about um, paying workers in beer rations, um, and also ingredient lists um, and distribution orders. Um, so it's a big operation, um, and it's also controlled by the state. Uh, it's There are some laws in the code of um, Hammurabi um, that talk about how tavern owners need, like, basically, if someone tries to pay you in corn, you have to take the corn if it's enough corn. 
And if you don't do it, you get drowned. So they're very serious about it. But we know um, that you know there are taverns. It, it's a very standardized practice. Um, there's also architectural evidence at this time. Um, so there's uh, evidence of vats and ovens. Um, but what is a little confusing is that it can be used as a brewery or a bakery. Um, in Egypt, we know that often breweries and bakeries were one and the same. They were both used because they do basically the same things. Um, and in Mesopotamia, we have less evidence for that, but there is one site that is, a, they thought it was just a bakery until they found a cuneiform tablet that said brewery on it. So that was pretty conclusive. But that's really the only evidence we found of this is for sure a brewery. Um, what's the point of experimental archaeology? Um, so, I mean, even today, there are so many different types of beers, and they connote very different things, like a Bud Light is drunk by a very different person than, say, a Guinness, and it makes you feel a different way. And in Mesopotamia, it was much the same. There were lots of different types of beers. There was one tablet that said there were nine different types of beers, uh, different colors, filtered, unfiltered, um, some are non-alcoholic, uh, so finding that out is really important, and they're also often associated with different um, different events. They say fancier beer for festivals. Um, for workers, they get kind of a, a thicker beer because it gives them calories for the day. It's basically a meal and a drink in one. Um, and certain socioeconomic groups will drink more of one beer than the other, so it tells you a lot about Who's living here? What are the uh, divisions in the society? Um, it also tells you regional differences. Uh, it's a lot like microbreweries. Each brewery does very different things, resulting in very different beers. Um, and you can also trace like uh, trade networks and cultural um, things being passed from one culture to the next, as you see different techniques and ingredients spread around. Um, also, doing things in practice often yields very different results than just reading about something. I mean, when you buy a desk at an Ikea, you're like, that's easy. And then you actually make the desk and you're like, well, this is horrible. I should never have done that. <laughs> and that's kind of what it's like to do experimental archaeology is actually figuring out what, it, what was it like to actually do these things. Also. It's kind of like time travel, because you get to see the, the, what it would actually be like, smell the smells, taste the taste, and it's a very visceral experience that you don't really get through writing. Okay, so this is the main experiment done in like the 80s, uh, that basically every experiment since then is based off of this one translation of this Hymton and Kazi, there are lots of issues with this. First of all, the hymn is in 18,000 BCE, which is about a thousand years after the techniques it's talking about, which is very significant. Also, uh, it's a hymn, it's not a recipe, it's not exact, it's not specific. And the translate, I have some issues with the translation of it as well that I'll get into. But it does tell you the basic things that happen. Um, so first it talks about the water source, we're in Mesopotamia, so the Tigris and the Euphrates River um, are going to be your water source. Also, rise of wires if you're in a slightly different place. Um, then it talks about bakir, which is a bread, and this is, in, is what introduces the yeast into the beer. Um, it's very easy to make, it's basically just barley flour and water. Um, and they add dates into it. They add dates into everything at every step of the process. They love dates. Um, but we're not really sure. They added aromatics. Not really sure what those are. We know that the Egyptians used spirit weed um, and the Syrian roots. Maybe they did that. There's also talk of maybe adding honey into the buffet bread, but nothing is for sure. Um, then they malt the barley grains, which is basically they just get the seeds wet and they lay them out and they wait for them to grow a little bit and then they dry them out. Then you mash the seeds. So you just grind them up, you 
get them wet again, you mix them with the, the pan. Um, some people think it was heated, some people do not think it was heated. Um, I do think it was heated because one of the lines talks about cooling the mash afterwards, so that makes it sound like it was heated up. Um, and it spread out on reed mats. Um, and then there's a step that may or may not happen where they uh, filter out the chunky bits from the actual liquid. We cannot tell for sure if this happened because you can't really tell what the vessels were used for. You could only tell that they had beer in them at one point. But there are there is evidence of um, vessels with like slats in the bottom. So it does look like some level of filtration <laughs> happened, but it may have happened after fermentation instead of before fermentation. Um, then it's just, you know, put into containers and sealed, they wait, um, and then sometimes it's filtered afterwards and sometimes it's not. Um, so problems with this experiment. Uh, first of all, the, the pear bread, um, they apparently you need special government permission to put dates in your bread um, before making the beer, so they didn't do that, um, so they couldn't do that. Also, there's an issue of whether or not the bread is twice baked or not. They, in this experiment, decided to twice bake it um, because, and I had this issue as well, I, I just once baked my bread. Um, it's just kind of still a little bit wet, and it doesn't heat very well. Um, so they decided to twice bake it, but some people disagree with this. Um, there is evidence that they stored the bread, so I would say it's probably likely twice baked. Um, they also, they think that there was more yeast in the original. They didn't have much evidence for this, rather just like, that's what they think. Um, the equipment is a big issue in this. They partnered with a brewery for this and they used fancy modern equipment, which is an amazing opportunity, but uh, for archeology span is actually a huge hindrance because they had to thin this mesh out a ton so they didn't destroy this really fancy equipment. Um, which yields a completely different result than what they would have done in the past. Um, and then the translation. Um, there's this one word, don't know how to say it, gestin, gestin, something. It could mean, it basically <coughs> just means something sweet. Um, it could, it was originally translated by the translator as wine, um, but then the people in the experiment didn't like that. They sent it back and said, can you actually change this to grapes or raisins? This is a big deal though. It can, it can mean either of those things. Um, but if they added wine, ironically, the beer would not be alcoholic because it doesn't have any yeast in it. But if they added grapes and raisins, they have yeast on the outside and then it would have made the, the beer alcoholic. So that's a very big you know, difference between these two things. All right, the second experiment um, is really great. They used um, ceramic vessels. They even made the ceramic. They, they modified it by adding calcium carbonate in it so it would be more accurate. And they made it on a slow turning wheel, so as, as accurate as they could make it. Um, and they made two batches, one with modern equipment and one with the, uh, the old equipment. Um, Unfortunately, they did not provide the recipe or how these two batches were different. Um, I actually only found out about the ceramics from a pottery website that was talking about it that did an, an interview. They didn't even mention it in the article I read. Um, so I love that they used the correct equipment. However, I would like to know much more information. So my recreation, I took the recipe straight off of a YouTube thing called Tasting History. Um, it, it's a very simplified recipe, but for my first time, I was like, let's just, let's keep it simple and let's just try and make a beer. Um, and thank you, Sean. I could not have done this without Sean. He was very, very helpful during this whole process. So, first we put the balling in water and you just let it sit for a day, then you, put it in these like cheesecloths and you're meant to spritz it like every so often so I just hung it up in my shower and when I was in my shower I just... <laughs> um, but it, it worked so... Um, when it molds, the, 
grains look like this. They just grow a little bit. Um, and then you put them in a tray and put them in the oven and they just dry out and get crispy. They smell really nice. Um, and then this is the Bethia bread. I did not put dates in it and it's once baked. Um, it smelled really good. It tasted very bad. <laughs> and then this is beautiful pictures. Uh, we mixed it all together. We also added date syrup. Um, we did one where we just added date syrup and honey because we thought that was definitely historically accurate. And then we made one uh, that would taste good. So we added um, pomegranate, pomegranate syrup, um, more honey, more date juice, uh, or date syrup. Uh, and then we just like let it sit, these things on the top, make sure that it doesn't explode. Um, and then we filtered it out. So we siphoned out all of the, you see all the sediment on the bottom here? We siphoned all that out. That's what you will not be drinking. <laughs> Sometimes they left it in, it's good for calories. Um, it looks horrible though. So then we put it in the freezer to kill the yeast and that, that's basically the finished product. The one that's slightly darker is the one with pomegranate syrup in it. Um, in the future, I would like to make it way more historically accurate. Um, so figure out what additives do they actually have. Um, I'm gonna need more textural sources for this. And again, each place is like so different from the other place. So you have a lot of wiggle room there, um, but residue analysis is developing a lot. So we're starting to see what was actually in these things. There's this um, one experiment where they actually managed to get yeast out of these containers, regrow the yeast and brew actual beer with it, but they didn't do it for this specific region and time period. But the technology is available, so that would be great. Um, I would also like to figure out the papier recipe, add dates, and I would love to figure out, is it once baked or twice baked? I think it was twice baked. Um, and I want to use original equipment. This is an example of a filtering vessel, so you can see how you know it's got these little slits in it, um, which filters out a lot of those big chunks, but not all of them. Um, and it would be lovely to get reed mats to pull the mash on instead of my little tray. Um, that's pretty much it. I think those are my <laughs> oh, yeah, question. Is it that Um, One of them, the one without pomegranate syrup, tastes very sour, like a really sour lemonade. Um, not the worst beer I've ever had, but <laughs> I, would, I would recommend the other one though, which I think is actually pretty good. It's, it's sweeter. Yeah, you can decide for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we have time, I have one question. I mean, first a comment. I love that you put a bottle of Ninkasi on your presentation. It is a beer that is made in France, in your or in my PhD. It's a great brewery. Um, do you know the date of the, the date of the first attestation of grape in Mesopotamia, because the first representation that I know, and I never really looked into it, but it's sixth century BC, uh, and I don't know that they weren't growing grapes because they were not making wine. Right. So, because it's a Levant uh, Egyptian thing. Um, did you know when we had the first grapes? I I don't know when I was you know, looking up the fruits that they have, great, they were listed, but I didn't look at when right. uh, it first was introduced. I think you should also explore that to see if it was more date or pomegranate or grapes that could sweeten it. And also white yeast, white yeast uh, that doesn't always come from our grapes, but that you yeah, can like, they, just collect. That was one of the ways that they talked about doing it, is just like sitting it in the open and being like, yeast, come and make me ferment. Yes, <laughs> but it, it's a thing, like, if you, I don't know if you are really bothering COVID, you can, uh, there's many blogs about like collecting white yeast to use in baking. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so our next, you know, for beer, we move to wine, uh, but not just wine extraction techniques and distillation techniques. And our next speaker needs no introduction because you've already heard one um, for him. So Sean, 
is going to talk to us about uh, a type of wine called Polarity in Wine. So this is a paper that's developed in conjunction with my class, um, Law and Life in Ancient Rome, um, where we talk about the law in Rome, but also what legal sources can reveal about life in ancient Rome. And spoiler alert, many interesting things. <laughs> so. Hello everybody, I'm John Trani from this report. Um, we have a presentation on heavenly water, clarity and wine, fraud, and the practice of distillation in their own world. Obviously, if you know from it, you can hear us. Throughout the course of this presentation, I'll be examining what clarity and wine is, how it would have actually been produced, and how much of it would have actually been real. Um, to start off with, clarity and wine is by far one of the most well-known in your own wines. Um, it's well, one of the most well-known vintages. Poems, graffiti, pottery, medical texts, and even imperial edicts all sing the praise of this famous vintage. However, given the description of what and what information we have about this king of wines, there are several parts of the story that don't add up. Learning wine is such a widespread and well-known drink in the empire to the point that even ancient writers use the, more, uh, use the majority of it as being fraudulent. And its description leads one to believe that it can only have been created through supposedly later developed production techniques. Uh, a little bit of background on Roman wine. Wine production and trade was important, incredibly important to Roman society. It functioned as a social stimulant, a religious and ritual drink, as well as a vital trade good. Wine was so prevalent, it was estimated that a member of the Roman population would have drunk two thirds of a bottle of undiluted wine per day. However, it was also often diluted, both as a way of making it last longer and also making sure that the water comes with it doesn't kill you. Um, the production of wine in the Roman Empire focused around four main provinces. You have Gallia, Hispania, Achaea, and Italia. Latin inclined, uh, France, Spain, southern Greece, and Italy. Of the four, Italian varietals were considered to be the best and most expensive, and the majority of prime wine production in Italy proper was focused around Tuscany and Campania, you know, Tuscany and Campania where Flarnian wine was produced. Uh, the origins of Flarnian wine, um, the origins of Flarnian wine come to us from a Roman writer, his real name, uh, Silius Italicus, um, writing in the first century about humble farmer named Falernus, he was given the gift of winemaking by Bacchus and is granted um, the entire mountain here. Which I'll point to you this. this entire section is a result of his hospitality towards Bacchus, who's made into great vines, and as such, it was a very popular area for wine production in the classical period, or at least as the mythology goes. Despite the mythological nature of the story, it is still obviously there's some truth to the fact that this was a very profitable area for wine. Uh, one of the earliest descriptions we have of wine itself comes from the first century BC writer Dionysus of Halicarnassus, a historian who wrote extensively on the history of early Rome and his more Hellenistic and Pliny counterparts. When he wrote about the sack of Rome the, by the Gauls in 390 BC, he included a reference to how much wine the besiegers drank in their captive stockpiles. Right here. They all drank unmixed wine. The wine produced there is the sweetest of all wines after learning is the most time like. Uh, Falernian wine was also the standard by which many of the ancient world judged their wines, with Marcus Trentius Varro, an agricultural writer, espousing the superiority of Italian wines, specifically Falernian, to all other agricultural products in the empire. He says, what spell shall I compare the Japanian, what wine to the Falernian? Long story short, it's good wine. Um, a couple aspects of the wine that are the big question. The color. Um, Falernian is a really strange drink. The wine description seems to be contradictory to the historical and archaeological record. For one, we just hear from the color. Most wines in the Roman Empire would have followed the traditional dichotomy of whites and reds from every day. The few descriptions we can have of its color often compare it to amber or honey. Though, off, though most appreciate this an early form of wine oxidation or matterization, which is MTP. Um, Dioscorides, a first century physician, also gives a good anecdote of the relative strength of the compared to other wines. Uh, as you can see here, um, unsuitable for the dull sided or for much to be taken as a drink. Obviously, it's a fairly strong wine. And it was supposed to be even stronger compared to its Italian neighbors. In terms of the aging of the wine, an interesting facet of its description comes from the surprisingly long shelf life. Most wine in the period would have been drunk relatively young, as preservation, certain storage methods such as casks, glass bottles, stuff like that, really were in their infancy at this point. Uh, however, there are several descriptions of this wine being drunk for nearly centuries after ori original vintage is produced. Uh, one particular vintage, one called the Agamemnon vintage, was from 121 BC and was, was considered to be the vintage of a lifetime. The most well known of its production, and several ancient sources detail having the opportunity to taste the wine nearly 200 years after its vintage. Uh, for example, the guys from Alkyo, they money before we show these as common satiricon, axed the big shot when he served his 180 year old vintage at a dinner party. 
Um, do you even consider drinking a normal wine after such a long period of time would be foolish? Um, as it would have turned to vinegar nearly a century before. Another description of Falernian from Pliny the Elder records that the Emperor of Rome was once served a 160 year old vintage of Falernian, crystal goblets. For an emperor who can serve something of a glorified vinegar makes no sense, and especially considering the higher guard the wine room held in. And there are also no dearth of sources claiming the extraordinary aging properties of Falernian. Again, our friend Laura up here. There are brands of wine for Falernian, for instance, which are more valuable when brought out the more years you have kept in the store. <coughs> Uh, wine in the modern era tends to be drunk within 10 years of its original vintage, with only 5 to 10% of the wine improving after one year, and only 1% of wine improving after 5 to 10. So, that's also the modern era, with that in mind. Uh, in the Roman period, this trend would have, been, would have been accelerated, as preservation methods for wine were often harmful to the wine itself. Uh, storage amphora were often sealed with pitch or resin, which would seep into the wine itself, often even the flavor. Uh, clay amphora also had strong evaporative qualities, and the wine sealed within, for instance, would just disappear. Um, the descriptions of Falernian wine aging leave us with an enigma. No normal wine would be able to survive for centuries without upgrading the quality, let alone improve it even in the modern era. <clears throat> As such, the only types of wines with ABVs, or alcohol percentage by volume, so high are modern fortified wines such as Commandaria or Port, and liquors such as Brandy and Cognac. And then the one the most interesting one to me, the description of the wine, is its proof. Um, one of the more peculiar descriptions of Falernian wine comes to us from Pliny in his natural history. There is no wine known that ranks higher than Falernian. It is the only one, too, among all the wines, that takes fire on the application of flame. This is very strange to say at least for wine to have, as it would need to be above 40 ABV, or 80 proof or above, to be able to actually take fire. Uh, there is a natural limit, however, to the alcohol percentage able to reach the natural fermentation, with the higher end usually resting around 18%. Which is also why I didn't try making this. <laughs> By far, Falernian wine is one of the most widespread wines referenced in both literary sources as well as actual archaeological evidence. However, the seeming availability of this wine in all corners of the empire, as well as its surprisingly cheap price, make it an early form of wine fraud one of the only ways this is possible. Again, Pliny the Elder comments on the increasing cases of early wine fraud and even mentions Falernian as being one of the main victims. Today, not even the nobility enjoys wines that are genuine, so low as their commercial honesty sunk that only the names of the vintages are sold. In terms of the ubiquity, um, even the most well reputed wines in the period were far from the same adulteration or outright fraud. As said best in O'Donnell's work, as Falernian became a byword for luxury, inevitably the demand for it spurred spurious Falernians into the market. The Taverna Hedonis, as you can see on the left, your right, by the way, the left here, um, is an ancient bar in Pompeii which actually provides an excellent archaeological anecdote for both the availability and price of Falernian wine. On the wall of the tavern is an, is an intact wine list, and it can be seen laying out the options for drinking. For one, as, which is the currency, you can buy drink wine. For two, you can drink the best. For four, you can drink Falernian. However, common sense, as well as the price of Diocletian, completely contradict this both in terms of pricing and valuation of the wine. The Edict, Di the Edict of Diocletian, in 301 CD, the Emperor Diocletian attempted to curb inflation and a massive increase in prices by setting down a series of price edicts across the empire, across thousands of different items. It didn't work, however, it was very good because it gives us a good look at all the different sort of products of the empire, their price, and their average cost. Um, in the price edicts, the value of six taris, which is a modern half liter of wine, of Falerian specifically, was set at a maximum of 30 denarii communis, or 30, 60 denarii. In order to provide context for how completely out of line this is, I would be, it would be important to examine the average pay of a laborer in Pompeii. Um, around the time of its destruction in 79 AD, the average pay of a laborer in Pompeii was about eight as, or half a denarius per day. Um, extrapolating the math from both of these conversion rates, there is a massive disparity between the Falernian wine valued at four as per half liter in a tavern versus the edict which counts it as 960 per half liter. Uh, this is suspicious, the equivalent of your local sizzler for your truce. Go back from Ben O'Donnell. Throw that in. Uh, in terms of putting better perspectives than the true rarity of learning wine compared to the much more common table wines, um, according to the research completed by Chirinia and Ben Limbrigan, the average Roman citizen was drinking half a liter per wine of wine per diem per capita throughout the Roman world. This wine would, of course, be diluted, however, Accordingly, 37.5 million liters of wine were consumed per day, and 13.7 billion liters were consumed per year at the height of the Roman Empire. Falernian wine, in this case, would have only made up about 
0.00004% of all wine produced in Friend, with a production of only 510,000 liters, based off, of the, based off of the estimated 170 or so hectares of land available in Arculernus. For such a wine to be sold and exported as much as the archaeological record indicates would be practically also statistically possible. This is a description of college distillation parks. I'm not going to read that out. I can just give you a quick description. Um, distillation is essentially boiling off alcohol from the fermented base and then recondensing it to make a much stronger alcoholic beverage. The process is very similar to what we use today with still or an alembic, and they're usually made out of glass or copper so as to not impart any more flavors than they already have in the drink. Um, due to the description of learning wine throughout the literary body of evidence, it must have been a distilled wine. Uh, given that it require an alcohol percentage over 40%, and the only way that this can be made to prove about 20% is the distillation, it would make technically make Flarnian wine the world's first brandy, moving your description date found by 1500 years. All right. uh, in terms of the traditional history, um, the idea that Flarnian wine was the earliest filled beverage does not have credence in respect to the traditional history of distillation. The scholarly consensus on the distillation of alcohol is that it was created in the 9th century through the work of Alexandrian Arab scientists and philosophers such as Al-Kindi and Al-Farabi, after which it spread throughout the Middle East, eventually making its way to India as well as Eastern and Western Europe. Um, the earliest example of distillation we have so far comes from a uh, Bronze Age site in Iraq called Tepe Gaura. The site itself was relatively small, covering only one hectare of land, and it had a community of about 150 to 200 people. And during its excavation in the mid 20th century, archaeologists discovered a device composed of three pieces of pottery from the Calcolithic period. The discovered device consisted of a deep bowl and a pot set within, as well as a strainer for holding the solid distillate material in place. The device was easily reassembled once it was discovered and clearly was intended to be used as a still. So you can see it right there on the right one. Uh, an experimental archaeologist named Maria Belgiorno attempted to show that this device could be used to distill perfumes, and she recreated the artifacts to work the scale. She noted that the size, the shape, and the spout's position for both pieces allowed them to work as a traditional lembic gel, comparable to modern copper curtains. The device could have easily been used to distill alcohol and had all the essential design aspects to do so. After conducting the experiment, Belgiorno concluded that, that it was completely capable of distilling botanical ingredients, such as pine needles, to obtain perfume, perfume water and essential oils. She even goes as far as to say, we cannot exclude that the same apparatuses were used to distill alcoholic drinks from fermented compounds. The theory that this site was also a production center for distilled alcohol holds credence because of the lavish funerary goods present at the site. I'll give you some examples from the Greco Roman world to give some context. Uh, there are several dozen references to the distillation of substances throughout the Hellenistic and Roman periods, with the majority of them originating in the Eastern Mediterranean. Aristotle, writing in the 4th century BC in his Meteorologica, states that this I know by experiment, the same is true of every case of its kind. Wine and all fluids that evaporate and condense into a certain liquid state become water. Aristotle has clearly done experiments with distillation, and even admits to having distilled wine himself. However, he quickly writes it off as an experiment, part of the experiment, due to his thesis being that everything turns into water. Not important. Um, one writer, again in the first century BC, by the name of Dioscorides, wrote an alchemical text regarding the production of different types of metals and stones. While this may not seem pertinent to the process of distillation, alchemists were some of the first people to write on these topics. And it was later the Arab alchemists who perfected distillation. Dioscorides writes in an excerpt about creating hydrogerum, which is essentially modern quicksilver, that um, the soot that sticks to the pot is scraped off and cooled and becomes hydrogerum. It is also found in places where silver is smelted, gathered together, and dropped from the roof. What Dioscorides is describing here is the, process, is the distillation of metals in the form of quicksilver, which recondenses in a liquid form after having been heated and then cooled again. There is evidence that normal citizens of the empire were well aware of the phenomenon and used it for their own purposes. Alexander of Aphrodisius writes in the 3rd century that sailors at sea boil water and suspend large sponges from the mouth of a bronze vessel to imbibe what is evaporated. In drawing this off with sponges, they find it to be sweet water. This is an incredibly important reference, as it shows that even simple merchant sailors and journey people would have been able to figure this out. It's a very clearly widespread technology, and it could be understood by people with no scientific understanding, actually. The thought that this couldn't be transferred to the to a modern land base to a land based distillery is not very probable. So the odds of when you say that again. To say that such technology was only limited to sailors and couldn't be easily transferred to a land-based distillery for wine seems more probable than the idea they didn't have it at all. 
As mentioned earlier, Greek and Roman alchemists were one of the main driving forces in the scientific discovery of the period, and as such, most of the technical writings we have come from these early alchemists. Um, the most important source for the development of distillation during the Roman period comes to us from an Alexander, Alexandrian writer named Zosimos of Panopolis, uh, who talks about a, a famous Alexandrian scientist named Mary the Jewess. Uh, Zosimos claims that she was the first to ever discover how to distill liquids, and he also gives a very good description of how such a device would have been I, I don't know which slides. He gives a very good description of how the device would have been constructed and how it would have worked, as you can see on the left in the 11th century. Uh, however, from his writings, there is no written evidence it was ever used for or intended to be used for distilling alcohol. However, there's an experiment done by two scientists, Anthony Butler and Joseph Needham, who recreate this entire device using modern techniques, but out of the same materials they would have done originally, and they did an experiment to see if you could actually get alcohol out of it. And as you can see by the table over there, they took uh, every five milliliters of alcohol that was distilled, they would take measurements, and as you can see, they actually did produce alcohol. Uh, the recovery of 82 to 84 percent of the aqueous ethanol by simple distillation is a substantial accomplishment for nearly a century, for, for a still nearly two millennia old in design. Despite this, there are a few drawbacks, mostly regarding the fall off of alcohol content distilled the longer it's still in operation. However, that would not negate the fact that such a device would have performed admirably, especially for one situated perfectly within the time period. And in terms of how such a te important technology could be lost for centuries, I'm going to point to this over here. This is called an aerophile. Um, in the first century CE, a Greco-Egyptian engineer named Pyrrho of Alexandria managed to build the world's first alopile, or steam engine. The Roman writer Petruvius gives a description on the left here. It essentially, you keep the center ball, it spins around, it shoots steam out, and it actually is the world's first steam engine. However, the technology was not really recognized for what it was at the time, and it was treated merely as a curiosity and a temple object before being faded into obscurity. Such an important discovery to have been disregarded by both its contemporaries and later writers then supports the idea that earlier practices of distillation, especially those not well documented, could have faded into history. In conclusion, learning wine was the first brandy to achieve a cult like status across the Mediterranean and was widely and was traded widely enough to be a household name. However, most of the learning wine drunk by a wide Roman populace would have been so in name only, as many unscrupulous people, business people took a widely respected name and attached it to their own crops. Distillation could very easily have been adapted to small scale breweries such as those in Mount Clarence, and the small amount of their resources still exists to support this and make it feasible. The loss of this technology, later reinvention, perhaps rediscovery by the Arabs in Alexandria in the 9th century CE, still speak volumes about the effects of this technology, even into the modern era. Because right now, what I wanted to do is, uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. And then, this is the moment that we normally announce the award that we give to a graduating senior that achieved the highest GPA. And uh, this award comes with the O'Neill Endowment uh, stipend. This year is $500. And the award goes to, drum rolls. Say poison. <laughs> mothers here and her grandparents so I know that they are all very happy and we are as well maybe my colleagues can say something about Sage since all her family is here so Caroline, Heidi uh, yes photograph yes oh come for a photograph from mom essentially <laughs> come, come up Dr. Oh, come, 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 come up come up honestly can I get one with Dr. Gibson too he was like yes. my first professor uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank yes. you. Thanks. So, so get. Let's get first. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm keeping this short. We're running a little late, but um, I really wanted to thank again my colleague Heidi Fessler for helping put together this order of all the um, the talks and actually for filling in and teaching the capstone courses in the fall. So I know this was a lot of work, especially since, since she is a visiting assistant professor and was teaching three courses uh, each semester. So let me introduce Heidi, who is going to give the, uh, the talk today uh, as a faculty. So Heidi, uh, Dr. Heidi Fessler is an archaeologist and historian of ancient Israel. 
She received her PhD from UCLA Near Eastern Languages and Cultures and her MA in Hebrew um, Bible at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. She has participated in multiple archaeological digs in Israel, most notably excavating an ancient Egyptian fortress in Jaffa along the Mediterranean coast. Her interests include historical geography of the Holy Land, ancient warfare, and the Bible in its historical context. Um, and today, she's going to be presenting on an article that she uh, has published, uh, the Assyrian military network in the southern Levant, reconsidering provincial boundaries in antiquity in the ancient Near East. Um, right? And um, let me just say also how grateful I am for all the work that Heidi has done, de developed a number of new courses, uh, had them all approved with core attributes, and she's launching a new course in the fall, Introduction to Near Eastern Languages. So we're all very grateful for her work. I'm sure her students are applauding already. Okay. I don't know if they're applauding because they have to hear me talk enough, so I don't know if they're talking more. Okay. And plus, they've probably heard some of the speech before. Um, here we go. Okay. So thank you, Professor Zechariah and Professor Savage and the rest of the Classics and Archaeology faculty and adjacent Classics and Archaeology faculty um, just for your encouragement and support. And then also I want to say a big thank you to all of the inspiring and interesting talks and for, from our students. And we really appreciate your enthusiasm about ancient studies. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about the Neo-Assyrian Empire and some conclusions that modern scholars have uh, have come to about them and the ways in which we can refine our understanding of the Neo-Assyrian Empire further. You probably noticed that I called them the Neo-Assyrian Empire and this is just a modern scholarly convention to decipher the people living in northern Mesopotamia, which is modern day Iraq, from the Assyrians of early time periods. Uh, the name Assyria comes from the worship of an ancient deity in the Assyrian pantheon named Ashur, uh, which was also the namesake of a significant capital city in the region. We distinguish three time periods, Old Assyrians, Middle Assyrians, and Neo-Assyrians, based mainly on the changes in their dialect of their language Akkadian, but also on differing political characteristics, which, we, which evolved over the thousands of years of <coughs> existence. While Assyrians dabbled in expanding politically and economically outside of the core of their homeland during the Middle and Late Bronze Ages, known in this region as the Old and Middle Assyrian periods, it is not until this Neo-Assyrian period, specifically in the 9th to 7th centuries BCE, that we see full-scale military campaigns aimed at expanding the borders of the Kingdom of Assyria. Um, they do this, in fact, on such a large scale that we call this the First World Empire. Assyrians get this designation as the first empire based on three characteristics. One, longevity. They were able to maintain this model of expansion for almost 300 years. Two, unmatched military power and unprecedented control over resources. And three, political overhaul of their conquered territories. Um, and it's this third point about political overhaul of, their, of Assyria's four neighbors that we're going to investigate further today. So early scholarship on the Neo-Assyrian Empire understood the empire as a territorial state, meaning that it took over huge swaths of land, like the map available, and this is on Wikipedia, which we're going to get into that in a minute, on the left. And then scholars argue that Assyria mapped out the provinces in their newly acquired territories with specific demarcated boundaries, like the map that, uh, by Oatsen over here that's displayed on the right. Um, we will be talking specifically today about the Assyrian provinces in the southern Levant. And by now, maybe you know what the Levant is after all these names. <laughs> uh, the problem is, different provincial outlines are presented in different publications, and there is no scholarly consensus on where and how provincial boundaries formed. Here are some examples from the southern Levant of different, very reputable scholars mapping out Assyrian provinces. For nearly, nearly a century, scholars have debated the configuration of Assyrian provinces and have attempted to map out the boundary lines of each Assyrian province. 
scholarship has especially concerned itself with demarcating provinces in the southern Levant. Uh, but even with the availability of a robust data set, including archaeological remains, Assyrian texts, and biblical literature, there are still several publications that outline conflicting geopolitical maps. Most of the maps of the Assyrian Empire in the southern Levant in use in textbooks and articles today, over the, even over the last century, represent Assyrian expansion as a territorial annexation. However, we'll get into this later on, a closer look at these data suggests that the nature of Assyrian occupation in the southern Levant was a network of strategic locations along supply lines rather than these bounded provincial territories. At the root of the inquiry into Assyrian provinces is this clay tablet called the Eponym List, a text uh, in which lists of years are, uh, are each marked by the name of a government official. So if you were like special, you get a year named after you. Um, and uh, the Eponym List includes Assyrian officials or governors who were presumably stationed in capital cities that oversaw a larger territory that's often translated as province. In the southern Levant, these indi individuals were attached to the cities of, oh, you can't really see it. Okay, we're supposed to say, okay, Megiddo, Ashdod, and Samaria. According to the accepted interpretation of the eponym list, these cities therefore housed the Assyrian provincial governors. Though we have names of the governors, we have very little information about the goings on of the governors other than their obligation to collect taxes and military troops. And we don't have texts that specify the boundaries of the territories they oversaw. Still, modern historians seek to decipher boundaries of provinces based on what we know about the geography of the region, the linguistic makeup of the region, and any other ancient texts that could give us a clue. For instance, the Southern Levant, uh, they use the Bible and sometimes even the Talmud to uh, come up with uh, this understanding. Scholarship that focuses on deciphering Assyrian provincial boundaries began in the 1920s by Swiss scholar Emile Horror, who got the idea to take these city names from the eponym list and attempt to map out boundaries of each province. He used the eponym list as a starting point to look at the geography and other possible texts that could help understand the political makeup of each region. Uh, for instance, if there was a river or a mountain range that could serve as a natural border. Forer's ideas about mapping provincial boundaries still influence scholars today who accept Forer's notion that there were indeed carefully demarcated provinces, but have different opinions on where exactly the boundaries of each, of each province are located. And although textual information is indeed limited, several publications take their cue from Forer and use the eponym list as a starting point to discuss boundaries of Assyrian provinces, specifically in the southern Levant. You can see here four maps that have configured the boundaries of Assyrian provinces of the Levant differently according to interpretation of data. Just a glance at these maps demonstrates how many discrepancies there are. Uh, for instance, um, I'm going to talk about a few of them briefly. There's differently, different configurations of Megiddo, one of which provides the province with access to the Mediterranean coast, while the others see Megiddo as a landlocked province. Um, I also call your attention to differences in approach and interpretation of provincial boundaries. Whereas Oatsen and Forer focus on the capital lists, or the capitals listed in the Syrian text rather than the exact geographical contours, other ma maps place more emphasis on the topographical features. That's why you see some wavy lines there, especially valleys, hills, rivers that might serve as natural boundaries. For Ashdod, uh, down in the south over here, some maps acknowledge its provincial status, but also include the important coastal territories of Ekron, Ashkelon, and Gaza alongside the province, suggesting that Ashdod had a very small area of jurisdiction versus other maps that provided a larger territory. In Transjordan, Rodner leaves the region blank due to the dearth of text that could prove its provincial makeup, while other maps outline possible provinces based on broken texts. And you might notice that the province of Dor, um, at Dor in some maps, uh, is in some maps but not in others, and that's because it's based on a hypothetical rendering of a broken text. Speaking of Dor, biblical archaeologist Anson Brainy offered an alternative view on Dor that allows for a consideration of how provincial boundaries might have altered during, or according to changing political circumstances. According to his interpretation, 
Dor was the provincial capital early on during the time of the Syrian king Tibbaq Pileser III, so we're here in the 730s BCE. But during the time of Assyrian King Esarhaddon in the 670s BCE, so about six decades later, Dor came under the jurisdiction of Tyre, a, a northern coastal city uh, that managed the commercial exploits of Levantine ports under Assyrian supervision. This idea highlights the potential fluidity of provincial boundaries as the Assyrian Empire grew and added additional regions to its territory. Alternatively, the lingerie approach employed by scholars investigates political organization of the Levant in Persian and classical texts. This method accepts that the political systems from later time periods might have their roots in Assyrian imperial administration and encourages one to consider how empires might inherit established systems of control in peripheral zones. While this approach can be helpful in answering some general questions about political control, it does not allow for much change of the Assyrian system and might only capture the political configuration just prior to the collapse of Assyria, if at all. These different maps and approaches to Assyrian territories in the southern Levant illustrate how scholars employ a combination of toponymy, topography, Assyrian, biblical, and classical texts, and still reach conflicting conclusions. This is coupled with an archaeological record that also does not reveal evidence of distinct provincial boundaries during the 8th and 7th centuries BCE. The capital cities of the three confirmed Levantine provinces, Megiddo, Ashdod, and Samaria, all have evidence of destruction that's linked to Assyrian military campaigns in a subsequent <coughs> rebuilding phase dating to the time of Assyrian occupation. Two of these cities, Megiddo and Ashdod, have Mesopotamian-style courtyard buildings thought to be the hallmark of Assyrian political presence, and Megiddo has a city gate uh, similar to those in other parts of the Assyrian Empire. On the other hand, Samaria was rebuilt, but without a courtyard building or any other Mesopotamian characteristics. In addition, the regions surrounding the capital cities of Megiddo, Samaria, and Ashdod also suffered from the same Assyrian military campaigns. However, the population lost during the campaigns did not recover. Only 50% of sites remained in the region around the city of Megiddo. The area around Samaria also experienced 68% population decline following the Assyrian campaigns. And the regions around Ashdod underwent a population decrease and although Ashdod is considered a capital city for Assyria, um, it was smaller than it was before Assyrian invasion. Overall, the once thriving kingdom of Israel suffered a major drain of population and limited development in the region took place following Assyrian campaigns. The lack of material culture makes it difficult to discern evidence of provincial boundaries on the ground. More importantly, the decrease in populations of building projects in the southern Levant diverges from other provinces closer to the Assyrian heartland in Mesopotamia. In contrast to the southern Levant, provinces closer to the Assyrian heartland experienced an increase in population, as well as increased numbers of agricultural villages and the institution of large administrative centers. This is mainly due to deportation, a practice whereby Assyrian military captured prisoners of war, many of whom were from the Levant, and forced them to settle en masse in Mesopotamia, where they became farmers or construction workers to benefit the imperial complex. The infrastructure of large, highly populated provinces in Assyrian heartland were meant to sustain a large population, as well as provide additional food and supplies to Assyria. Strategically placed Assyrian outposts monitored the highways and the region was populated with deportees, some from the southern Levant moved to subject to the Assyrian Empire. In his work in southeastern Anatolia, an extension of the Mesopotamian heartland, archaeologist Bradley Parker outlined the traits of provinces characteristic of this region. He included that in these highly populated Assyrian provinces, um, Assyrians appropriated local cities on transportation corridors, the main cities were surrounded by newly settled agricultural villages. Main cities had evidence of Assyrian style construction. There was change in surrounding settlement patterns and new settlement in the region and increased population. So I label these, I put a label on these Bradley Parker, and it is um, that they're, I call them production provinces because they were meant to produce a large number of goods to maintain their increased population as well as provide the empire with supplies. As we've learned, unlike the eastern neighbors, provinces in the Levant do not show evidence of increased population and crop cultivation. 
A Syriologist, Nicholas Posgay, offers that Assyria was forced to embrace a different type of economy than the Levant based on its unique climate, agricultural production, and stronger focus on trade and production of international highways. I label these as transit corridor provinces with the characteristics including one, small Assyrian ports along trade routes connected to a provincial capital, a diminished population, proximity to a coast or other re region with access to precious commodities, or in this case to Egypt. Uh, and a transit corridor uh, would also be farther from the heartland of Assyria, in a location where distance impeded the degree of control that Assyria established on territories closer to the capital. Further, the location of Assyrian capitals in the southern Levant along major north-south routes uh, suggests that the nature of Assyrian occupation in the southern Levant exists as a network of strategic locations along supply lines of future battle. The main function of these territories is to further military conquest and monitor vassal states. Within the Assyrian Empire, a carefully maintained highway dubbed the King's Road connected the vast empire to facilitate the transport of troops, messages, and good, goods to and from Mesopotamia. This focus on a network of military occupation is in contrast to the idea of precisely delineated provinces. The different functions that an Assyrian territory can serve in the empire challenges the concept that Assyria created uniform provinces with clearly demarcated boundaries. Perhaps the reason that the southern Levantine Assyrian provincial boundaries are so difficult to decipher is because they were either very fluid or not extensively laid out. It is likely that governors and other officials were placed in key Assyrian cities along important routes in order to monitor traffic and maintain military way stations. This type of use suggests that the land was set aside for military and defense purposes. Military campaigns and attrition warfare diminished settlement uh, and replaced towns and villages with fortresses meant to defend conquered territories as well as prepare for future expansion. The goal of expansion in a frontier zone also makes the boundaries of a province less distinct. Boundaries on a map tend to skew perceptions of ancient region by the modern scholar. Smith writes, Monica Smith writes that depictions of boundaries unwittingly guide our expectation for ancient human behavior because the presence of boundaries and application of shaded overlay imply a certain level of cultural cohesion, administrative effectiveness, and bureaucratic control. In the case of Assyrian provinces in the Levant, maps indeed imply a solidarity within a particular region and break in connection from locally run regions. A focus on provincial boundaries can encumber a study of provincial formation processes. The frontier status of the Levant is coupled with its role as a transit corridor connecting Africa, Anatolia, Western Asia, and the Mediterranean and served as a conduit between the stronger political powers. A serious campaign to the southern Levant affected the overall landscape in order to create a corridor on land as well as access Mediterranean ports. The nature of Assyrian occupation in the southern Levant appears to exist as a network of strategic locations along supply lines of future battles, rather than these bounded provincial territories. The notion of provincial boundaries in this area of Assyria expansion, expansion should, should be thought of as, flu as fluid and perhaps not even existent, as the main function of these territories is to further military conquest. Uh, the focus on military occupation is in contrast to the modern interpretation of the establishment of Assyrian provinces ultimately based on a concept developed by Thor a century ago. While exploration of how Assyria governed its territories are helpful, application of a rigid model of control can hinder an understanding of the function and purpose of the southern Levant and the Assyrian Empire. Indeed, in recent years, scholars have characterized Assyrian political control as, control as a network rather than a territorial state with these provinces. However, despite a push to understand the Assyrian Empire as a network, modern maps represent Assyria as a territorial state. You can see here a Google search uh, of accessible sources only display Assyria this way. This larger map is one of one that's available on Wikipedia, and it gets several things wrong about the Assyrian Empire, <coughs> including Assyria's control over every inch of land, including like the entire desert. Um, these maps are what is used in college and high school classrooms all over the world to teach about the Assyrian Empire, but they depict an inaccurate nature of Assyrian control and mislead those who are studying our first empire for the first time. 
As Assyriologist Mario Limrani puts it, as the Assyrian military did not expand like an oil spill, as maps depict, but as a network of sites aimed to entangle foreign cities into the web of Assyrian control. So last year I worked on a project born out of my frustration of these maps and what they represent under the mentorship of a program called Digging Up Data. Um, I worked on a proof of concept um, seen here to develop a set of maps that would present Assyria as an expanding network of control rather than a territorial state. This project required that I find coordinates of several provincial capitals, list of the Assyrian eponym list, which is part of anything, and determine the possible dates of annexation and consider the different roadways that were used to connect these important sites. I also had to learn about GIS systems. Uh, what you see here is a proof of concept that I plan to make into an accessible map that can be used by college professors and high school teachers in order to present an alternative view of the Assyrian Empire. Um, and here's just a, a different, you can see how different these maps look. Um, I'm, so the next step on this project is that I'm working to refine the artwork, sorry, it's not that pretty, um, and work on the accessible online platform to help make this alternative view accessible for everyone. Um, and then it's really important to me uh, for us to consider uh, uh, and foster conversations about what maps represent and misrepresent about the ancient world. So that's it, I'll just put that in there.